talk session. I'm yeah. <laughs> I I am I'm amazed that so many people are here. There was a loud party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There, there was a lot of partying going on at night, and uh, so the room filled up quite well. Maybe other people will come in. We have a three-hour marathon session. This is the longest light and talk session we ever had, I think. So the first introduction is um, how do you do lightning talks? How to make uh, the lightning talks work for you? This is for the speakers. This is for the audience. So how do we make the lightning talks work for you? work for us as the organizers and of course for everyone out there on the streaming devices and so on. It's, it's very, very simple. All the speakers that are already here, please tell the other speakers that might come in, please speakers sit in the front row here. Consult the schedule, uh, mind uh, when your time will come up uh, for your talk. So if you see the previous speaker on stage, just uh, prepare yourself, come to the stage manager, he will give you instructions. Then move to the side of the stage during the talk before your slot, and then when it's your time, get on stage quickly. Please speak into the microphone. Look how I'm holding the microphone. If I take the microphone away, you won't hear very much. Grab the microphone like this and use your thumb against your chin if you're excited and something. This always works. I'm a bit excited too and shaking and so on and it works quite well. Please speakers, don't turn around. There are no slides behind you. This won't work for you. You have the slides right in front of your screen. You can look at your slides here and uh, advance the slides using this clicker here. Stay calm during your talk, relax a bit, and it's for five minutes, it's quite cool to be up here. And to have all the people here listening to you. And just deliver your talk. <laughs> Stay in time, get your applause, and then leave the stage. And please leave the clicker here on the podium for the next speaker. Please, please, everyone, or a lot of speakers take it with them. Please leave it here, we need it. So next thing, to the audience. Of course, be excellent to each other and watch the timekeeper. I will introduce Honky here. He is the first time on the stage for the lightning talks. Thank you, Honky, very much. And um, we give you a quick demonstration how this thing works. If you don't know it already, you have five minutes for your talk. The first few, four minutes of your talk, you will see a green light here. If you step aside, uh, a bit aside as a speaker, you uh, notice this. And it advances for the first four minutes. And after four minutes are up, it turns yellow for 30 seconds. It gets up more and more yellow. And the last 30 seconds, then you have still time to bring your last slide. The last 30 seconds will be red. Honky, please advance to red. And then it's time for you to help us get the speaker off the stage. In the last years, we used this nasty ah sound. And uh, last Congress, we decided to laudate the speaker from the podium. And so give the speaker, when the five minutes are up, I give you a sign. Please count with me. Let's practice this. Five, four, three, two, one, and applause. Uh, the beginning was a bit slow. Let's practice this again. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, thank you. This was excellent. So that's from me. So let's get started. Uh, the first talker, is, the first speaker is a long time speaker. He's here and every, come, come, come on the stage, Franti Shake. Franti Shake, Algador, Apfelbeck. Please come on the stage. This is your talk. This way? Whatever you prefer. Okay. Pa -pa -pum. Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, opening uh, talk. I have been told that I'm supposed to be completely natural. Uh, the first one was about uh, what to do and how to do it well. Uh, this one is supposed to be what to not to do. And just a random topic, it's a Fudekin base. Uh, I am with Fudekin base for nine years. Uh, we are people who like uh, 
playing with the food, drinks, fermentation, beyond. We are here on the camp, so you can come and visit us. Um, this year, basically, uh, we have done several events already. If you have been at the, the Ghent at the New Line, we have been there for a bit. We have done big event in Czech Republic, which is called Kvas, uh, growing uh, specialized in fermentation. Uh, that one I was involved especially. Uh, this year we do the camp here, so you can find us on the campground. We will talk in a second slide about that. And we hope to be, of course, also in Leipzig, and preferably inside, if possible. So. Uh, let's come to the camp uh, because that's now also is the most hot when I have seen the 30 degrees on Saturday Sunday It's going to be very interesting especially for the tear down uh, We are in the sector R8 if everybody knows on the map uh, You can find us easily by the smell and by the lights and the sign We are going to have again experimental kitchen two workshop venues and uh, loads of activities uh, You can come for example tonight for cider tasting uh, if you have booked in already There will be crappa tasting which is unofficially and nice and otherwise we will do different workshops like kombucha making uh, There will be sessions probably for the bread making and other stuff So we are open you can come you can play uh, you can use our kitchen. It's fine uh, we have also some new things this year uh, on the campground. Uh, we have finally, for the first time, a cooling trailer, which makes our life a much, much easier thing. And also for the villages around, because they can cope things, which really helps. Plus, we have a bar, so you can come and you can have some ciders and check beer on the tap. Uh, do not hesitate, we will be there. So that would be kind of, you know, the four here. Uh, of course, there will be probiotic drinks because you need to rehydrate yourself also without alcohol. So we have a few hundred liters of those. And uh, just pop in. We are there. It's going to be fun. Actually, it's fun already. Now, uh, autumn, what we are going to do, like, you know, in the next few months. I will be personally doing cider season, so I'll be doing more cider, which you should be some of it uh, able to taste the last season at the CCC Congress. Of course, we will be at the Congress. Uh, at least we will try to be as close as possible as we did before, uh, hopefully in the main venue. Uh, now, uh, we are also taking care about the logistics because it's starting to be a bit uh, more demanding with the stuff uh, like, you know, uh, let's say being more specialized and getting better equipment and more of it. So we are now getting our storage right and kind of improving the driving licenses and uh, trailers and playing every event like with one ton of stuff going in and out eight times. It's a lot of fun. Basically, if I can say one thing, the lock engines here are my personal heroes, you know, every day more, oh, sorry, every year more and more. So, you know, progressing on the stuff, we are getting, I think, more and more, I would say, semi-professional. You know, we can come and check. We have even running water and it's warm, you know, for washing the dishes, you know. There's even a hand soap this time. So, you know, getting there slowly and steadily. Uh, I would like to therefore once more invite you to come in, uh, see what we are doing, and maybe in the line of like you know minute or so, uh, we can like you know mention other activities. Uh, there is of course you know things like you know today for example we make a syrups, non-alcoholic, completely fun. I have actually exercise in the morning with uh, picking up around 20 kilos of Mirabel uh, at uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, there will be other stuff, you know, like of course we will have one more cheese tasting. Uh, otherwise, come if you are interested in something, talk to us. We have still slot pots, you know, on the list which are free. And what we are actually really trying to do is to be as open as possible so you can come and do something what is related to the food, drinks or bio and do it in the place. So you can do your workshops, of course, you taste your tasting events. If you are not prepared for this time, let us know, come now, and we can prepare for the Congress. Let us know in advance, you know, in the worst case, come just a bit in advance. We have slots, and you know, like, more use it is, better it comes, okay? So thank you very much for everything, uh, for your attention, and I hope to see you very soon at Food Hacking Base. Bye. Thank you very much. Uh, Fratishek, the next talk up here is Chris Cray with MB2.R50H-OT.
That is excellent. So now he said it, I don't have to do it. <laughs> so the, the title of my talk is, uh, as he said, uh, and the subtitle is How to Help Users Choose Less Bad Passwords. Uh, <laughs> um, so that might be your first question. What the? It was an article run by the Postillion. It's the German Onion News Network, and it was run in mid-March of 2014. Mid-March, not first. And this is the article. IT experts name it as the world's best, safest password. Even the CCC was quoted. If you see uh, Malte, tell him regards. <laughs> I don't know who he is. And uh, next question might be, who am I? My name is Chris. I'm a nerd. I'm a coder. I work for the LRZ. LRZ. What's the LRZ? It's the Leibniz Rechenzentrum. Uh, I like the English title, title better because it says Leibniz Supercomputing Center. It has the word supercomputing in it. And uh, we're an IT service provider for universities in Munich and basically more, lots of them around Munich. That's us, nice building with a supercomputer in the background. That's us, very funny people. That's our fastest supercomputer being top nine of all the known computers that have been benchmarked worldwide currently. That's our boss representing at the last Congress. And so you might, what? So what? Whereas um, I'm working for the central identity provider, the IDM. We have over a quarter of a million users and uh, we can set about 30,000 passwords. All the others get synced in from other IDMs. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So, of course, we have a password policy for all of these passwords, and we have, of course, the usual boring stuff, which is use capital and lowercase letters, and we also use pwned. Pwned? Pwned started out as a typo. If you're really excited, P and O are pretty close together, and so actually it was owned, so it's owned? It means I own you. I have now possession of your computer and I can take something from it. What might that be? So ownage in progress looks like this. You have a cloud and there's data raining out of the cloud and there's Mrs. Sternthaler collecting all the data. She may or may not be responsible for the data raining out of the cloud in the first place. So there we have a very long list of passwords on the black and dark internet. But don't fret, we have a hero in shining armor. His name is Troy Hunt. Troy who? He is a security researcher and blogger. He has a funny website, it's called HIBP. That stands for Have I Been Pwned? Now we know what that means. Uh, you can check your password online on his website. That seems scary, but it's actually pretty cool and warrants a talk on its own. Maybe we see ourselves next year. And you can download the list of passwords. And you say, download? Nah, let's not do that. But he said, let there be crypto, and the database went poof, and through the magic of SHA-1 turns into a very long list that is indeed published on the white internet. Magic, SHA-1, <laughs> sorry, no time, please ask your neighbor. So then what? Then we download the database, it's a very handy 10 gigabytes torrent. We unpack the database into a very unhandy 22 gigabytes plain text. Then we write a bit of code and we stick the code into our password workflow. And then we kindly inform our users if their password has been stolen and we reject it. So how might that look? If a user comes up with that password, that is a stupid password and that says something about the user. It says, if you take a stupid password that has been used by a million other users, it has been stolen 10,000 times already, and because it's stupid, you shouldn't be using that. If that is your password, then it's a very clever password, and it's probably your own, and you're the only one using that, and it, you're using it everywhere, and somewhere it has been stolen. That also says something about the user. So in both cases, choose a different password. And the only question that is left, so what about that? The most secure password in the world. Is that stolen? No, of course not, because it's the most secure password in the world. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, the next talk is going to be uh, about digital analog TV. Thank you again for all the translation angels and subtitling, uh, subtitling, uh, subtitling angels. Thank you. Hello. 
Okay. Hello. Ah, yeah, digital analog TV. Timer. Uh, four years ago, um, we were given this cool radio badge at, at camp, and this opened the path to SDR and signal processing for me. And like one year later, uh, the Kais Computer Club was celebrating its birthday, and someone did an art installation with a bunch of TVs in our hackerspace. And at some point, I thought, how do I get a picture from my computer onto this TV? And the name of the game is PEL. PEL is short for face alternating line. These are some specs, like the resolution, the frame rate. PEL is interlaced. Um, which makes the frame rate effectively only 25 frames per second. There are some frequency bands we can use, and there's a Chrome or subcarrier. What this is, I will tell you later. Basic PEL, you could say, is a way or a standard of analog encoding or analog encoding for video information. Uh, PEL comes out of this cable. This cable is very closely related to this cable. This you may know from your video consoles. And the difference between this cable and this cable is that the signal on the white cable is modulated, which means that it's just multiplied with a carrier frequency. So um, how, does it get, how does a picture get onto the TV screen? And every old TV screen is a so-called cathode ray tube. You have a big, long vacuum tube with a fluorescent screen and electron beam shooting onto the screen, generating a spot. The brightness of the spot is regulated by the amount of electrons you shoot. So by varying the current of this electron beam, you can change the brightness. And by scanning the beam across the screen, you can make lines, and by doing multiple lines, you can get an image. It's called um, scan lining, and it's what all old TVs did. So what our signal has to um, carry is the brightness information of the spot. This, of course, only is for black and white, but we will come to color later. Also, the signal carries uh, synchronization pulses. You need to know when to start the next line. It's like in VGA. But in this case, we do it in bands. So they're the signal carry carrying the information and the signal carrying the synchronization share, uh, share the same medium. Um, here's the specifications of how these sync pulses should look. Also, there's so-called um, train pulses for horizontal sync. So you need also need to know when to start the next frame. So there are special um, pulses telling the TV when to start the next frame. Here, for example, is one scan line or one line of the picture you see on the top left. It shows that it's going brighter and brighter and brighter from left to right in between two sync pulses. OK, but how does color get into this? Um, for this, we need to do some math. As you may know, white is red plus green plus blue. This is because our eyes are built that way to receive red, green, and blue light. Most all, all, all screens are red, green, and blue. We can change this formula and say white is red plus blue uh, white is green is white minus red plus blue. Why do we need that? The thing is we are already transmitting the white information. We are already transmitting the black and white information. And the thing is that colored television is backward compatible to black and white television. And they said, OK, we are already transmitting white. If we also transmit green and red and blue, that's redundant. Let's get rid of green, only transmit red and blue and white, and calculate green afterwards. Um, there's also some fancy names for that. The color information is called chroma. The brightness information is called luma. And you may have seen these characters YCBCR or YUV. That's the formula names for these values. This is the most complicated math. Um, as I said, there's a color subcarrier. And what they do is they take the chroma information and they multiply it with a sine wave of that frequency. And so what you get in the end is the brightness information mixed in with the color information. Uh, and to know, oh, so let's skip that, I have no time. So what are the needed steps to transmit radio, uh, to transmit uh, videos on radio? We need to resize the video, we need to do a color space transformation, we need to do interlacing and modulation. First approach, second approach, I have no time for that. Current approach is to use FFmpeg um, and green radio. FFmpeg, I have this call, in the beginning, we say which file we want. Then we say we need raw video because all TVs don't understand that compression. Then we say we want to uh, scale and letterbox our video because modern videos are 16 to 9. The TVs understand 4 to 3 ratio. Um, then we want to interlace. Interlacing is explained in the FFmpeg documentation page. What it says is it takes the odd lines of every odd frame and the even lines of every even frame and interlaces them together and outputs them. Here we again say we want raw video and we want uh, YUV pixel format. This is our, our color space transformation. 
Here we say that we want 25 frames per second or 50 frames per second interlaced, and this just pipes it into our program. And we also can double check our image. We can write it to a file and import it into GIMP, separate it, readjust it, and there's our Big Bug Bunny uh, uh, frame capture. Here's the green radio flow graph. It looks more daunting than it actually is, and I only show the interesting bits. To show what's happening, I use these three frame parts. This in, in the top is the brightness, and then we have the value of the blue and the value of the red part. So in the beginning, we just read it in, and we add some spacing for the synchronization pulses. As I said, the synchronization is done in, in, um, in signal. Then we add some more padding because it's needed. Then we add the things, and then we transmit it out. If you want any information, please go to the slides. <laughs> With you. Um, thank you very much. Those were really, really a lot of slides. The next talk is in German from. Uh, <coughs> so, Felix D. From Felix D. Uh, eine Wende für flexible Verkehrssysteme. Hallo. Uh, I'm here to be here. I challenge the signal angels. If you don't speak German and you're interested in the talk and the topic, please approach me afterwards. Eine Wende für flexible Verkehrssysteme. Es geht darum, dass sich einiges ändert. Wir reden viel über E-Mobilität, aber in Wirklichkeit passiert was ganz anderes. Es gibt ÖPNV-Lösungen, Karten und so weiter in Europa, in Deutschland relativ viel. Aber ansonsten auf der Welt sieht es noch sehr anders aus. Wir haben, ich würde sagen, über die Hälfte der Welt hat keine Daten von ihren Verkehrssystemen, vor allem in Afrika, Lateinamerika und großen Teilen Asiens. Und das ändert sich im Moment. Und die Frage ist, wie sich das ändert, weil die Verkehrssysteme natürlich ähm, weniger formell sind, nicht unbedingt einen, ähm, einen klaren Zeitablauf ähm, haben, einen Sketcher, einen, ähm, einen Fahrplan, wie wir das gewöhnt sind, hier zumindest. Ähm, das heißt, wir brauchen neue Ansätze. OpenStreetMap ist cool. OpenStreetMap kennt wahrscheinlich jeder. Das ist die Wikipedia der Karten. Man kann editieren und dann dreht sich das Ganze um. Man hat einen Editor und jeder kann mitmachen. Ähm, viele machen mit, ähm, dadurch gibt es sehr viele Daten, es gibt viele Leute, die ähm, aktiv an dem Projekt mitarbeiten und auch ÖPNV-Daten aufnehmen ähm, und vor allem im globalen Süden. Das können Leute selber machen, das machen Städte teilweise, das machen ähm, verschiedenste Arten von NGOs, ganz viel äh, diverser, als wir das vielleicht ähm, hier gewöhnt waren. Ähm, hier haben wir in Nicaragua eine so eine Karte erstellt. Ähm, mit den Daten will man natürlich auch was machen, also gibt man die heutzutage meistens in ein GTFS, hat dann ähm, coole Apps, die man benutzen kann, ähm, die andere Leute benutzen können, ähm, die Regierung macht eventuell mit ähm, und alle sind fröhlich. Ähm, in dem Fall die erste ähm, ÖPNV-Karte ähm, Mittelamerikas. Ähm, OpenStreetMap nimmt auch teilweise die Zeitkomponente raus, dadurch wird das Ganze weniger komplex und wir können ähm, wirklich überall auf der Welt ohne irgendwelche großen Aufwänden, äh, ja, Aufwendungen ähm, Karten erstellen, die Daten aufnehmen und haben direkt Lösungen, die uns ähm, helfen. Und wie gesagt, das ist alles erst der Anfang. Ähm, in Wirklichkeit ist nämlich der ÖPNV ein bisschen anders ähm, und der, ich nenne den semi-formal oder ähm, Alternativ. Ähm, oft ist er frequenzbasiert, deswegen ist auch vielleicht die Zeit nicht unbedingt so wichtig oder man möchte sie anders halten. Ähm, es gibt ganz viele andere Haltestellen, die Bereiche von, ähm, ja, ganze Streckenbereiche, wo man die, den Bus anhalten kann, wie man es braucht, also Demand Driven. Ähm, und es gibt natürlich noch mal eine viel größere Art von Transportmedien, als wir das vielleicht so gewöhnt sind. Aus diesem Grund arbeiten wir an einer Erweiterung von GTFS, das ist GTFX Flex, was vor allem ähm, in die Richtung geht Demand, also ich halte hier einen Bus an oder ein bestimmtes ähm, Verkehrsmittel an oder ich ähm, habe bestimmte Verkehrsmittel, die mich wohin bringen, ganz andere Arten, ähm, je nachdem wohin ich muss, ähm, verschiedene Routen, die an bestimmten ähm, Zeiten des Tages sich auch ändern können. 
Wenn euch das interessiert, sprecht mich an, ähm, kommt, ähm, ja, schaut euch die Website an. Ähm, wir sind gerade in der Evaluierungszeit. Wir wollen Rückmeldungen haben, wir wollen Ideen haben ähm, und wir wollen Leute haben, die mitmachen, weil hier sich wirklich gerade auf der Welt was tut mit ÖPNV. Dankeschön. Next talk. Do you hear me? The next talk is going about to be uh, do it yourself brain hacking to see in 3D, which is a bit interesting to hear. I'm a bit afraid, but we will see. Thank you, Ben Senior, for entering this talk. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm Ben. Oh, where's the clicker? There's the clicker. So actually last year I gave a talk at Christmas uh, about hacking how we see, about eye skills, which is was demonstrating how you can use virtual reality environments uh, if you have lazy eye to straighten up your eyes and see in 3D. And this project has continued and it's become more and more complex and larger and larger. And now it's composed of these five sub-projects. And it's become clear that we need a dedicated lead for each of these. So I'd like to tell you something about them because perhaps some of those leads are sitting here in the audience. The first part is about personal experience. To literally see what is possible with your own eyes, despite what your eye doctor might have told you. So this is a take-home app, sort of 10 minutes a day of training. And by the end, you should be far enough that you have the vocabulary and the knowledge to be able to speak to your doctor on an Augenhöhe. The second part, you know, words are good, but data is better. We need to be able to objectively see what's happening to the eyes so we can understand which techniques work best for who. And to do this, we've created a open source, open hardware eye tracking headset, which folds up and fits inside a Google Cardboard second generation for a handful of dollars rather than hundreds of dollars. So this gives us access to some really useful information, but it's no good unless we can get it into the hands of lots and lots of people, which requires manufacturing. And how can you manufacture something locally and affordably? Well, this is my primitive little prototyping setup with a cheap laser cutter, 3D printer, and an inkjet. And what I would really like is a fireproof cabinet with these things stacked vertically and much better automation so that an, entre an you know, enterprising entrepreneur anywhere in the world can take this blueprint, create this from the design, and just go to clone it with demand. So at that point, perhaps you're reaching lots and lots and lots of people. And this has always been the end goal. It feels like there's feedback, I'm sorry about that. Um, the end goal has always been to push on the science and to change medical best practice. And to do that, we want to harness this reproducibility crisis, which is rocking science. We want to turn it into our ally with open data, which means that all of the experimental data is openly available and nothing is hidden from view. With open source, so that researchers can modify these frameworks to challenge their hypotheses to answer their questions, but those changes are stored in the central repository and don't go anywhere, they persist. To make it reproducible, so every single piece of data is tagged with the exact build that created it, so researchers can take the same build, experiment with different cohorts, take different cohorts, experiment with the same build. And finally, this citizen science aspect. Can we get cohorts in the tens of thousands producing data each day, rather than the current state of the art, which is a couple of dozen people coming to a lab once every few weeks. So obviously this is quite ambitious and it's going to take quite a lot of money, but... Closer to you. Closer? Okay, I was trying not to make it so loud. Um, uh, yeah, we have sources of ethical funding that we've identified and we're quite far along, but that's another whole project in its own right. So here I'm really looking for somebody who is an excellent communicator 
somebody who can deal with individual investors, institutional investors, and things like crowdfunding. So finally, this affects a lot of people around the world. There's about 400 million people out there right now. And this is an interesting opportunity to build an open business, one that's really doing something worthwhile. My passion is not building businesses. So if there's anybody out here who with a proven record in building businesses and you're not greedy and you want to do something worthwhile, I would also love to talk to you. So if this has interested you and you'd like to learn more, then please come to the workshop tomorrow in Goldberg. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, the next one is Mars Robertson with 7th of October 2019 International Uprising. Just give me a minute to start the slides. Check, check. One, two, three, check, check. Hi. Uh, this is something big. This is something much bigger than myself. And it is completely not about me. It is about the international uprising, movement of movement, extinction rebellion. So the global change, the climate change, the global warming has been known for more than 100 years. There were these scientific papers in 1911. And uh, what, is, what is different uh, now that ExxonMobil was engaging in a fake news disinformation campaign. ExxonMobil once upon a time was the most valuable company on the planet and they actively engaged in the fake news campaign. What is happening now this is completely new. It wasn't happening a year ago, but the climate change now is so visible that, you know, Arctic is on fire. There is albedo, albedo effect. This ice does not reflect heat. The water absorbs the heat. All these models are, you know, getting out of, out of hand. So many climate refugees that this is not only an environmental issue, it is a national security issue, the collapse of the society. So, you know, what do we do with it? Because this message is very bleak, it is like hopeless. However, due to non-violent direct action by going on the streets, by going out there, uh, as uh, citizens, normal, regular people, people who attained this knowledge, we can tell the government to tell the truth. So no longer fake news, no longer propaganda and pushing one message or another, but hey, tell the truth, tell what is the situation. The second point is to act now, because we need to act now, we need to lower down the emissions. And the third point is that this is not a political movement. We don't want to acquire power. We just want to get work done. So these are the three guiding principles. There are also 10 uh, major rules. This, I'll just click quickly. Uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> These rules just make sense. They are simple, they are easy to understand. I can intuitively relate to that. And uh, Extinction Rebellion is a uh, movement of movements, international movement of movements, decentralized, no leaders, everything transparent, in public, open source. There is so many feedback mechanisms and it originated in the UK, so it is happening. And this date, the uh, 7 of the of the October uh, will be probably one of the biggest uprisings in the history of the humanity. It happens once in a generation, maybe once in a century. There was a 4th of July, the US declared independence. And uh, I think that it is possible that we will protest as long as necessary, that we will just 
go on the streets, we will build this type of camp, but not in the, uh, you know, Grand Z, Ziegel Park, but we will go to the major square of London, Parliament Square, and we will build the camp, and we will do this as long as necessary. I think that this is uh, one of the most important dates in the history of the humanity, and there are a few things that make me think that this time is different. Uh, for instance, around uh, 70 years ago, there was the uh, nuclear weapons. That was a game changer. 50 years ago, there was an Apollo project, Man on the Moon. That was a game changer. Around 30 years ago, the, the internet became, you know, WWW. Internet was a game changer. 10 years ago, uh, you know, uh, blockchain, the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, this is a game changer. Now Elon Musk is flying to Mars and establishing a new civilization. But until then, we have only one planet. The things are getting out of control. And now us, people, citizens, hackers, now we have the potential to tell the truth act now, and it is completely non-political movement. We are here to get the job done. Thank you. The next talk, the next talk is going to be from Michael Stapelberg about Distri, a Linux distribution to research fast packet management. Hello, everyone. Okay, so my name is Michael Stapelberg. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter if you'd like to discuss any more of this. My observation is very simple. Whenever I install a package in any of the bigger Linux distributions, it takes a really long time. And if you pay attention to the slide, uh, you can see that even for installing like a couple of kilobytes of Perl script, I need to transfer like 100 megabytes of data and wait 25 seconds. And this comes out at a data rate of just like three megabytes per second. And this astonishes me, given that my computer is easy capable of processing many gigabytes per second. So where does this discrepancy come from and can we do any better? So in the Distri Linux distribution, you can install that same package that you just saw on the slide before in just 0.1 second. And even for larger packages, such as the QMU package, which comes in at like 500 megabytes, uh, you can see that the installation rate is 100 megabytes per second, maxing out the gigabit link that I was using here. And it takes only 4.5 seconds to install QMU. So how can this distribution be so much faster than all of the established distributions? The first key idea is that we use images as the package format instead of archives. So instead of having like a tarball or a CPIO archive or anything like that, we use an image format such as SquashFS or CD images. It doesn't really matter as long as you use an image format. The big advantage of using an image format instead of an archive format is that you don't need to do any unpacking. So you don't need to first load something onto your hard disk, verify the signature, and then extract it again. You can just immediately mount it after you have downloaded it. And it turns out that downloading a file from the internet is a thing that we're really good at now. Like We can do it maxing out even fast links. I have, in fact, tested this with a 100 gigabit network card, and I can achieve package installation speeds of 12 gigabytes per second. The other interesting side effect of this is that when you use images for your packages, you can set up a package build environment, such as like change routes or pbuilder or whatever else you have in the established distributions, in merely a fraction of a second. And this takes many seconds in other distributions. Further, package installation, which just means adding something to the package store, is actually atomic. So you don't need to use fsync to synchronize disk access to your local disk. You can just restart afterwards, and there's no breakage. The second key idea is that we use separate hierarchies. So you can see that each program is available under a relatively long path, uh, which starts with slash ro for read only, and then it's followed by the full name of the package, including the full version number. So that means that uh, all of the packages that we have available are co-installable. So you don't have any conflicts at installation time, which also means that we don't need to do any dependency resolution at package installation time. The rest of the system is laid out as usual, so you have your slash etsy for config files and slash var cache, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then the last key idea that I want to present here is exchange directories, because it turns out that programs, if you install them into separate hierarchies, they still need to sometimes exchange data using well-known paths which, with each other. Uh, two examples for this are the MAN program, which shows, for example, the Nginx MAN page by locating it within user share MAN, or uh, GCC, your C compiler, which needs to access the header files of libusb if you want to link a program against libusb. The prudent approach that we're taking here is that we're emulating these well-known paths. So user include jpeglib.h can be read just like a normal file, but in reality it is a symlink to the package store. This design decision means that we are entirely compatible with third-party software or third-party sources that have not been yet packaged for this tree itself. Um, so you can just like download your favorite program from the internet, be it Spotify or Chrome or something that you need to compile yourself, and you can just run it on this tree. So about the project, uh, it is meant for distribution research. So the idea is that I'm setting a bar. I'm setting the bar very high. Like this is the minimum viable thing that you can use in order to have a working Linux computer. Um, I'm using this on my laptop for many months now. It works just fine. Like I can watch Netflix. I can run Chrome. Like all of the usual stuff that you want to do with the computer, no problem whatsoever. Um, I'm not looking for any users or contributors. What I want to do is um, put a little bit of public pressure on the existing distribution package managers and really ask these maintainers, why is it so slow? Can you use any of these ideas to make it faster? Um, so you're welcome to try it out. We have easy instructions for how to run it in QMU, for how to write it to a USB stick and use your computer from a USB stick, for how to run it in VirtualBox. You can run it via Docker or Google Cloud. Um, anything goes. And if this interests you at all, if you have anything to share, anything to observe, any feedback, or just want to talk, I'm very happy to talk, to this, uh, talk about this at any time. So just find me. Thank you. In German as well, and uh, the next talk will be in German. It's from Bettina, 25 Jahre Internet für alle, und dann der Ping e.V. Just give me a minute. Yeah, hi. Just like uh, you said, it's in German, but if you want to learn more, you can talk to us in English later. We are more of a local interest. So, yeah, hallo, ich bin Bettina vom Ping e.V. Und hallo, ich bin der Dredget äh, von der Foss AG, aber auch aktiv beim Ping. Und ja, wir erzählen euch jetzt was vom Ping e.V. Was ist das? Das ist die private Internetnutzergemeinschaft, gegründet 1994 von Studenten der Uni Dortmund. Und unser Hauptvereinsziel ist die Förderung von Bildung und Wissenschaft. Dazu machen wir hauptsächlich heutzutage Weiterbildungsveranstaltungen rund um Technik und Internet im weiteren Sinne. Ihr seht hier unsere früheren Jahre. Wir haben uns also sehr oft auf der Hobbytronic rumgeschlagen. Das ist eine Schraubermesse gewesen in Dortmund, aber auch noch auf vielen anderen. Wir haben es in Zeitungen geschafft und ähm, ja, hat sehr viel Spaß gemacht. Wir haben sehr viel Engagement da reingesteckt. Wie kam das Ganze eigentlich? Wir haben 1993 gedacht, wir wollen in dieses Internet, aber damals hatten wir ja nichts. Es gab T-Online nicht, es gab nichts und dann haben wir uns gesagt, na gut, dann machen wir es eben selber. Wir werden zum Provider, wir kaufen die Hardware, wir bauen alles auf, wir schaffen Internetzugänge für alle. Und deshalb haben wir im Januar 1994 den Ping e.V. gegründet als gemeinnützigen Verein und äh, haben auch von Anfang an Schulen ans Netz als Initiative bei uns gehabt, um, den, um die Schulen mit zu vernetzen, denen zu zeigen, wie das geht und so weiter. Das lief ein paar Jahre super, dann 19, also Ende der 90er kam die große Existenzkrise, nämlich es gab jetzt Sachen wie T-Online, die waren schneller und besser und wirken irgendwann auch billiger als wir. Und wir alle wurden älter, wir hatten Vollzeitjobs, wir hatten dann plötzlich Familien und irgendwie war die ganze Zeit weg, die man so als Studi hatte, was macht man da? Ähm, ja, wir haben uns gesagt, gut. Wir machen jetzt mehr auf Weiterbildung, weniger als Provider, um die Leute zu interessieren und auch Leute außerhalb des Vereins. Und irgendwann haben wir beschlossen, ja gut, unsere Einwahlleitung braucht kein Mensch mehr. Wir schalten die endgültig ab und ähm, wir machen jetzt nur noch Weiterbildung und andere Aktivitäten, wie ihr hier später noch ein bisschen sehen werdet. Hier seht ihr unsere Mitgliederentwicklung. Also, wie ich gerade gesagt habe, erst rasanter Erfolg, so bis ungefähr 1999, da waren wir bis zu 1600 Mitglieder. Und genauso schnell ging es dann auch wieder bergab, als die Leute, die uns nur als Provider genutzt haben, gemerkt haben, oh, gibt es ja woanders besser. Äh, 
Und da geblieben sind die Idealisten und die, die die Idee insgesamt gut finden. Hier seht ihr noch so einen komischen Knick im Dezember 05. Da gab es nämlich noch einen anderen Verein, dem ging es genauso wie uns, ein bisschen kleiner, der Prima e.V. Und da haben wir irgendwann gesagt, gut, wir schließen uns jetzt zusammen, wir bündeln unsere Ressourcen, damit wir das weiterhin stemmen können, auch mit weniger Mitgliedern. Und ihr seht, wir schrumpfen nur noch sehr langsam, äh, ja, weil, wie gesagt, die Idealisten dabei bleiben und ab und zu auch jemand über unsere Weiterbildung neu dazukommt. Hier seht ihr, was wir so getrieben haben. Das war ein sehr cooler Tag, aber still eben A40, als sie mal gesperrt wurde. Wir sind nominiert worden in der Initiative Wege ins Netz vom, äh, was ist das, BMWI, BMW Wissenschafts... Hm. Naja, äh, war jedenfalls eine ziemlich coole Sache. Und ähm, genau, der Dreadit wird euch jetzt erzählen, was wir heute so treiben. Ja, wie die Bettina erzählt hat, sind wir jetzt vor allem sehr aktiv bei den Weiterbildungen und wir haben ein sehr schönes Vereinsheim und haben auch gerade die Möglichkeit, dadurch, dass wir irgendwie zum Beispiel in der Lokalpresse öfters mal was veröffentlicht wird, auch Leute zu erreichen, die üblicherweise man bei einem Hackspace nicht erreicht. Also wir bieten auch Lötworkshops für Kinder an, von so ganz einfachen äh, Bausätzen bis komplexere Sachen. Äh, wir haben zum Beispiel das Donkey Car Projekt, kennt vielleicht der eine oder andere, ist ein Raspberry Pi, der so autonom das Fahrzeug, das Modellfahrzeug steuert, da haben wir so eine kleine Strecke aufgebaut bei uns. Äh, VR-Meetups, die halt auch von Sp über Spiele hinaus zeigen, was man mit Virtual Reality alles machen kann. Und es äh, ist nur so ein kleiner Auszug aus den ganzen Sachen, die wir machen, Workshops zu funktionaler Programm oder funktionelle, sollte funktionale Programmierung heißen. <lacht> ähm, machen halt auch äh, an der Maker Fair haben wir teilgenommen, wir machen Open Source Software Alternativen zu zum Beispiel Bildbearbeitung mit GIMP. Äh, wir haben auch, gerade wenn wir ein paar Senioren erreichen, bieten wir auch spezielle Vorträge ein für die Sicherheit im Internet, Browsernutzung, Handy absichern. Äh, dann zusammen mit der Foss AG gibt es auch so Nerdabende, wo wir uns zusammensetzen, irgendwie zusammen was kochen, snacken und irgendwelche äh, äh, schwierigeren Themen machen und sind da noch sehr aktiv. Und jetzt seht ihr noch ein paar Bilder von unserem Serverschrank und das ist noch die Truppe von früher, wie sie sehr aktiv war. Aber wie ihr jetzt gesehen habt bei den Mitgliederzahlen, die schrumpfen so mit der Zeit und deswegen sind wir auch hier, um quasi zu hoffen, dass wir noch den einen oder anderen begeistern können, der aus der Ruhrgegend kommt, aus Bochum, Dortmund oder der Ecke und Lust hätte vielleicht bei uns mitzumachen. Genau, und äh, ihr findet uns in der Nähe der Uni Dortmund immer noch, in Eichlinghofen. Wir haben ein wunderschönes Vereinsheim, äh, das gefüllt werden will mit wieder ganz viel Leben. Und äh, wenn ihr Lust habt mitzumachen oder wenn ihr vielleicht selber einen Verein oder eine Initiative habt und euch mit uns austauschen wollt, Ressourcen bündeln, was auch immer, meldet euch, quatscht uns an. Danke. Is Quantum here? Yes. Hello. Hello, yes, I'm Quantum, and um, together with Andreas Hornig, we did a project where we prepared it. We did automatic ground control points for photogrammetry. So when you have a drone and you want to make a photogrammetry 3D model of an area, you have to deploy ground control points to get a geo reference uh, 3D model out of it. So normally you deploy those tiles there on the ground, take a GPS device and measure their position, and then you can fly your drone over it and take photos. And afterwards, at the computer, you have to mark these ground control points in the picture, say this is ground control point number five and has this coordinate, and you have to click it in every picture, and then you can let the computer compute the model. It's a complicated process, but it works, and then you get a fancy 3D model. But we are lazy, so why we have to mark those ground control points? Um, computers can also find things, QR codes. Computer can find them, so they can find the position inside the image, and they can also extract information out of it. So we don't have to say this is uh, QR code number five. The computer knows it itself. So we have created this QR code format. We use the highest possible error correction within the 25 by 25 pixels, and we use the upper left marker uh, as a reference point. So the middle of this red box is now our coordinate. And we have created an scheme to make it really universal. You can encode in your OSM ID, so you can even pave it in your parking lot, a QR code, and say this is this position, and create it an OSM node, so our software can identify it. You can use a local ID, that's what we are using here on the camp, so when you're placing the QR code for a short amount of time, 
and then you can create a table where there's a lookup table where the ID and the coordinate is uh, associated. And you can also hard code coordinates. So when you have this quant control point, this is a plane that we uh, printed out and that we'll have here. You have to deploy these QR codes anyway, and you have to measure their position if you're doing it yourself. Here on the airfield, we will do it for you so you can skip both points, and then you can fly your drone and take the photos, and then there's the cool part. You can let the computer find the QR codes. So you say there are the images, find the QR codes, and then you get a table for the, your drone mapping, open drone map, for example, software to find these QR codes. And then you get a wonderful, hopefully wonderful, geo-reference, auto-photo, and 3D model. So we want you to participate in this. If you have a drone and want to fly here, fly over the airfield. It's down, go, the, uh, go to the ha uh, harbor, and then follow the signs to the airfield, and take photos. I will deploy these planes. We have six QR codes that we will place there right after the stalk. And when you're taking photos or using software, please post them on Twitter uh, with a hashtag CCC Camp Map. We still have some things that we have to uh, implement in our software. So if you want to code some Python, have a look at our issue tracker or come around and we can code together. If you're interested in any of these topics, if you're interested in drones, in imagery, in photogrammetry, just also come around and talk. You can find me at Carl soon. Um, Andreas Hornig is not on the camp, but you can contact him on Twitter, also me. I have a deck number, so also an email address. And we have the wonderful domain osm.to, where you can find the links to our, uh, to our project page. We have a camp wiki page, and we have also a Twitter account where I will announce when the QR codes are laid down and measured out. One last thing, maybe. Uh, I also doing a project about high precision GPS that I will also use to measure in these uh, QR codes. So if you're interested in high precision GPS, real-time kinematics, you can also come around and we read it up. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Quanten, for, for the cool talk. For the next talk, uh, Unified Alpha by Pippin, brace yourself for some heavy formulas. Is Pippin around here? Yeah. Welcome to the stage. Hello, uh, I'm Eivind Kolos, or Pippin, and I'm one of the GIMP developers. Uh, this is going to be a talk about pixels, but it's mostly going to be screenshots of my terminal. I'm going to talk about Unified Alpha. Unified Alpha, uh, to explain what it is, it's the combination of straight alpha and pre-multiplied alpha. These are two ways of representing pixels in images. And what people are most used to is what is called separate alpha, where you have a red, green, blue, and then an alpha component, each of them storing a number. And each of them are completely separate from each other. So the red only stores red, and the alpha is only about how opaque the pixel is. Pre-multiplied alpha, you scale each of the components um, by the alpha. So I have two columns here. On the right-hand side, we have some concepts related to pre-multiplied. The reason we want pre-multiplied or associated alpha is that the mathematics for compositing, that is putting two partially transparent images on top of each other, is a lot simpler with um, pre-multiplied or associated alpha. It becomes exactly the same math for all of the components. And we can easily do it with SIMD or on a GPU instead of the, quite a lot of computation. It's like one and a half times as many arithmetic instructions. The conversions between each of these representations is traditionally done this way. To go from straight to associated, you multiply the red component by alpha and for all the others. And for going the other way around, and we get into a problem because we were multiplying by alpha. And to get back to the original color component, we would have to divide by the alpha. And if alpha is 0, we have undefined behavior. And the traditional way to fix this 
is to just say that, well, if it is zero, it was probably black, which means that uh, associated alpha cannot store color information for transparent pixels. Here's an illustration of kind of what's going on if you go from straight alpha to associated back to straight on the top. And the bottom of this set of values shows that we just get blackout. And there's a similar thing going on if you go from associated to straight to associated. All of these examples store pure white, as in 255, 255, 255, or 111 in the color components. And you see in the bottom example where alpha is zero, uh, we don't get back to our original result. And this is some more information about these representations. Uh, associated alpha can store um, emissive information that is values where the RGB components are higher than the alpha. And this is useful for compositing things like fire or lightsabers. The actual problem we have here, this is a plot of one divided by x. x. The actual problem is that as we're approaching zero, one divided by x approaches infinity. And in integer precisions, that just means we blow out all of the data we can store. Uh, in floating point, however, it's a little bit different because the precision of floating point is actually really, really high, close to zero. So it mostly kind of works apart from the special value of zero. And I spent a few iterations on how to approach this. And what I've ended up doing is saying that every value that is smaller than a threshold, I treat like the threshold. So there is no zero. And this is the actual code I do for limiting it. So if alpha is bigger than 1 divided by 1 to the power of oh, no, 65,536, then I just say that, well, that is the value of the alpha here. So this is my computation of straight alpha to associated unified alpha. And it's the same computation as earlier, but I first limit the alpha. I store the alpha directly as it was. And the corresponding conversion becomes simpler. I just can divide with abandon, because I know it will never be 0. And why this particular value? Well, if you multiply by a power of 2, or divide by a power of 2 in floating point, and the power is not really, really high, you only change the exponent, not the significant. So it means that it is completely symmetric to go back and forth between these two representations, and we don't lose information. And in GIMP, this means things like you can blur an image and use the anti-erase feature of the erase tool, but it also means... Mm. Ah, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Very, very sorry for interrupt interrupting, but we have to stay in time here. And it's, it is a long session, and the translation, a, translation angels are really sweating in their box there, and we are very happy to have them here. So please give a big round of applause to translation angels. The, the next talk is from Dorota. Let's talk about suffering. Hello, my name is Drota, and I would like to talk about suffering. Uh, where's the clicker? Is this one? <clears throat> so, suffering is uh, a bad thing. Uh, I am sure that most of you do not like to suffer, and I'm also sure that you do not like to see others suffer. So, um, suffering is kind of evil, but how do you measure evil? Uh, that is kind of something that we can measure, and it's quite similar to suffering. So I, I have a riddle for you. How many deaths from nuclear power are there resulting for every gigawatt hour of energy? And for, for some help, there is also uh, the number from coal. Any guesses? Okay. You don't know yet, uh, but I am going to tell you. So, here's the answer. Uh, 
it's 40, it's 4,000 less. And for comparison, there is a number for hydropower. Nuclear power just happens to be uh, the safest in terms of deaths or the lowest in terms of deaths. Okay, of course, those numbers might be uh, disputed, but like the, the difference is so huge that you cannot ignore it. But what other things cause suffering. So like there is factory farming and there's 50 billion milliard for those who are not using the American system, 50 billion Americans, uh, animals <laughs> killed per year for human consumption. And like what kind of questions can we ask? Did they enjoy their lives? What do you think? Maybe not. How can we f actually find it out? Or is it even something that we should worry about? There are other things that we could worry about, like artificial general intelligence. Uh, I wouldn't like for a paperclip maximizer to turn all the world into paperclips or global warming. We had a talk about this already. Bioweapons, global poverty, those are things related to suffering. And this is where effective altruism comes in. Those things you have seen on the previous slides are uh, one of the things that have been identified as important for uh, reducing the suffering. Uh, and this is what effective altruism tries to evaluate. Well, what kind of things are worth acting on? How to act them? And basically, uh, we have the methods which are rational, scientific, informed, data-driven, which ensures that we are effective and we want to prevent the suffering and make the world better. So it means that it's altruism. Uh, and if you do not like to see others to suffer, then you are also an altruist. You can learn more about this uh, on the Effective Altruism website or 80,000hours.org. There is no really centralized place to learn about it. This is like more of a loose community of people who have the similar values. And therefore, there is also an EA Hub which just uh, lists a lot of local groups. There might be a group in your area. There are about 40 groups in Germany alone. There's one in Netherlands, as far as I know. There's one in Finland. And you, of course, can talk to me if you are more interested in the topic. I am usually hanging out around KS West. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. Please, all speakers, uh, try to hold the microphone just like this. Hold, hold it in your right hand, and this, this is about the right distance with your thumb. Thank you very much. So, 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 so the next talk is going to be about teaching IoT with open hardware in GitHub and Classroom by Thomas Arnberg. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the introduction. And hi, everybody. I'm a software engineer and maker from Zurich. And last year, I started teaching IoT engineering to bachelor students at an applied science university. This talk describes my teaching setup. The slides are on Twitter at Tomberg. Here's our IoT reference model, devices with sensors and actuators uh, connected to a backend, allowing, allowing physical and virtual interactions. The course is hosted on GitHub and covers the software aspects of IoT systems, including firmware, connectivity options, transport protocols, data formats, and cloud platforms. We chose hardware that is easy to get started, available, well-documented, and open source. It has a big online community for Google ability and supports Wi-Fi, BLE, or LoRaWAN. We use the Arduino IDE, and Python is still an option. It's an ESP8266, no surprise, and an NRF52840 for BLE, both with the feather footprint and growth sensors. There's a growth to feather adapter uh, made by Seed, and as a gateway, we use a Raspberry Pi 0, 0 W. To provide starting points and reduce redundancy, I added a curated wiki, so only I can edit it. 
Uh, we also have a Slack, which the students use to ask questions and help each other. For Laura one, we use the RFM95W feathering. It needs some hardware tweaks, so I made a little patch PCB. Still works, good. Uh, it's available on the wiki. And to collect issues, with hardware example code or slides, we use GitHub issues. That's not a surprise to developers, but for teachers it might still be new. So students can help fix the slides. A specific issue we had was using the ESP with the growth adapter. It turns out you need uh, to pull up a pin, and this can be done with an additional resistor. You've seen that the core slides are on GitHub, but what about the hands-on part? To provide a repo per students per assignment, we use GitHub Classroom. Each instance of the course is a separate class and contains assignments. We had an assignment per hands-on exercise and a group assignment for the final project. Creating an assignment results in an invitation link. This classroom project is open source, by the way. And the URL uh, can be embedded into the hands-on repo. And instead of cloning or forking the repo, this link creates a deep copy. The advantage is that this deep copy is private. And you see that the URL has the student's GitHub name appended, so you know who is who. And yeah, the students work on these repos and push their results. Only a teacher can see the repos uh, unless they make it public. And as GitHub grants unlimited private repos to educators, I use a separate repo per class. The setup is detailed in our meta repository. Check it out. The slides are all linked. And that's it from me. Thanks for your time. talk and all speakers it's quite normal to be nervous when you're up here it's just relax it's your time take your time and the next one is uh, Mario Beling and uh, is talking about Zuzi AI hello I'm actually not Mario Beling my name is Michael Christen we wanted to do this talk together but now I'm doing it alone so uh, I'm talking today about the nerd stream um, the nerd stream is talking to a computer and the computer will not only answer but maybe also solve a problem for you. And uh, actually there are now a lot of devices which uh, do something which uh, looks similar uh, like this. Uh, they are commercial applications and they are um, meanwhile in many households. Uh, but there is no real uh, completely open source personal assistant which can fulfill the same expectations as these devices. So that's what I'm talking about today. And because these devices are not only a nerd stream, it's also now uh, going to saturate the, um, the families all over the world. We should do something about the privacy uh, problem with these devices uh, because it happens that exactly the nerds which had this stream in the beginning are not adopting the idea because they want to have a device which is which is private and keeps your privacy and uh, doesn't talk to a cloud. So that's what we are doing. And uh, that's what we need. We need a uh, privacy respecting assistant framework. So this is not only a chatbot, it's a whole framework of things. And with a lot of people all around the world, we already worked uh, about two years on this problem. The Force Asia community has helped a lot there and um, a lot of contributions have been made to, the to a whole ecosystem of things which addresses a, very, a lot of conversational uh, applications. So um, the, 
this is such a big uh, task to do that we want to do to solve this problem not only with algorithms but also with a large community and therefore I'm addressing you all in this talk to participate in this approach and uh, we have some examples where this kind of approach was very successful one of them is the example with the Wikipedia and the Wikipedia um, made it very simple to contribute we learned also from other kind of open source um, uh, projects and we all bring this together to uh, fulfill this big goal to create a machine which can answer to our questions and our advantage is that a lot of uh, dynamic web pages are now providing JSON interfaces which we can just uh, take and take information out of a lot of web pages to make skills out of it so that's our approach and um, for this, we need a big ecosystem. Uh, the ecosystem looks like this. We have already a smart speaker based on Raspberry Pi and a, a good microphone. But we also have all these uh, apps, um, an Android app, iOS, and also a web a chat application. It's not only uh, able to answer questions with text, but also with pictures, audio, video, uh, graphs, um, pie charts, and so on. So um, what, we did, what we did is a big repository where you can put in skills, and we made it easy to make the skills. So if you go to Zuzi AI, you see this repository you can learn by example, click on any of these examples, and then you see how the skill language works. So with the skill language, we, uh, we're doing something similar like wiki code. So if you want to create a web page in the past, it, you had to learn HTML, but with the Wikipedia, it was easy to make it with wiki code. So our code is the language of thought, and you, if you click on that small I on the top right corner, you get an explanation what kind of syntax you should use. So this is uh, what uh, we want to do, and we want to do it with a big community, and we are now at a situation where we uh, want to reach out to all of you to help to make a lot of skills, so we can compete with these uh, commercial applications and make an uh, open source version which is privacy aware and uh, doesn't uh, get into the privacy of, of the people. So um, we have a workshop tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Please come to the Hack Center, where we teach you how to uh, make skills. And uh, please go to Zuzi AI and uh, just click around. It's a fun thing to do. Thank you. Please take the microphone down with you to the angels and leave the clicker rear. The next talk is Badge Magic. Like this. Please. Should I start? Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Hong Fuk Deng, or HP Deng, if you want to find me online. So I'm going to talk about this um, name tag that I'm wearing right now. We call it Bad Magic. So what is it? It's basically a USB power LED patch. As you can see, uh, you can access it through Bluetooth. But the funny thing is you don't need to pay your device to the phone in order to change the text. We develop an open source Android application that allows you not only to write any text, but also add different effects and clip as you, you can even draw um, um, on the app. So um, just a little bit background of the project. Uh, we found this device in the electronic market in Shenzhen, China. If any one of you have been there, there are all kind of uh, garrets that you can find. And uh, the batch came together with a very simple Android application and also iOS. It looked basically like this, what you see um, on the screen. Uh, it's not so nice and it's also closed source. There are also very limited text and effects that you can do and there's a mix between different languages. Uh, our community, we want to um, to, um, to build something different. We want to make a cooler app, but again, the, uh, the source code is not open. So um, some of the developers in Asia try to look into it as we, we plan to build something new that can um, send different messages and send different effects um, to the device. 
And here comes the uh, beauty of open source, why we try to figure out what is the communication protocol uh, that allow us to, um, to talk to the device. We found someone on the internet or they hacked into this a few um, um, last year. So, um, and, uh, so basically, he used a wire shack in order to inspect what's going on under the hood. And this person was so kind to publish all his finding online. I don't know if he's here today, but if um, Gao Ye Marshalling, if you are here, thank you very much for your work. Based on this work, uh, we develop uh, the new application that now available on Android. And also Android, of course, now you can do all kinds of stuff uh, with this batch. And at the same time, if you want to add in new effects or want to do something more with the application, you, you can do so the code entirely open source. Uh, these are the QR code. You can scan it and get the app to your phone. And again, this uh, project is uh, developed by the Force Asia community. Uh, we started the community in 2009, not so long ago, only about 10 years. So the whole idea in the beginning is try to foster open source education in Asia and engage more Asian contributors to the whole open source ecosystem. Um, Best Magic is only one of many projects that we're working on. You can find the code on the Force Asia GitHub. Uh, our developers are actively communicate on the Gitter channel. They also order Gitter channel of uh, different projects. Uh, so the thing that I want to emphasize here is not only the app that we're so proud of, it's not the product, but the journey, how we come up with this uh, whole thing. And then uh, this project allows a lot of young people to get engaged and work on open source technology. So we introduced this to the school and a lot of students got excited and want to learn more, okay, how they can drive Android application, how they can contribute to the community. And this is the way we want to go. So what next? Now we have the Android app. Uh, we're working on the iOS as well, and we want to add more devices into Magic. We are still working on open up the hardware of this batch and create our own open uh, firmware and hopefully to be released in the, cup, the upcoming months. If you want to learn more about us, uh, my already mentioned earlier, um, in uh, November in Sunshine, we organize an uh, open tech summit where we invite people everywhere to come to us. We can uh, connect you with hardware producer in Sunshine uh, and learn about the open source community in Asia. We are in Fosdam every year. And uh, in March, we have the annual Force Asia summit in Singapore, March 19 to 22nd. Uh, in Berlin, we also have the uh, Open Tech Summit. Um, uh, Europe happens every year in Homerfast. If you are around, please come join us. You can find um, the batch, um, the application online. And um, I also have a few here. If you want to check it out, come to me. Or you want to hack it and release the hardware. Come to me at the end. I will be also at the workshop of to see tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. Thank you for the talk. The next talk is going to be held by Jens Olich, which takes his presenter with him. And it's about digitalization and cyber are the two sides of the same coin. Have fun. Hello, my name is uh, Jens Olich, and on the internet I'm known as uh, Joel. I want to talk about uh, European politics and how fascinating it is. Um, and I've chosen one of the best quotes I've heard in the recent months. Digitalization and cyber are two sides of the same coin. Let's examine this quote a bit more. So, uh, on July 16th, we got a new president of the EU Commission. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, a German politician. Her former job was uh, the German Minister of uh, Defense, uh, but you might know her from uh, 2009, where she got the nickname of Zensursula because she was the only, the first federal politician to introduce uh, internet censorship on a federal level uh, in Germany. Um, it failed horribly, and uh, some of you might have thought, wow, this really does it, this breaks uh, 
um, this Brexit for me, I'm now doing something political significant. I'm going to join the Pirate Party. Now it's 2019. She is still politically significant. Uh, the Pirate Party, not much so, but um, she is now. She has now moved uh, to Brussels. Uh, Although, um, yeah, she now became the president of the EU Commission, uh, she was uh, confused about her job uh, earlier. Uh, she thought that the Council of the European uh, Union nominated her. That's what she wrote in her farewell letter to the um, armed forces, uh, even though it was the European Council. That's a totally different institution. Now, uh, Council of the European Union, European Council, many people confuse that, but uh, most people who confuse that don't apply for that job. So um, she uh, had some time to uh, prepare for her job. So she uh, wrote down her agenda, a union that strives for more, and published that. And there were lots of interesting quotes in that uh, paper, especially when it came to the part that was about uh, digital pol politics. Uh, she said, uh, to lead the way on a next generation hyperscalers, we will invest in blockchain, high performance computing, quantum computing, algorithms and tools to allow data sharing and data usage. Yeah, uh, blockchain and quantum computing, check, but no mention of open source, open data. Um, she also said, in my first 100 days in office, I will put forward legislation for a coordinated European approach to the human and ethical implications of artificial intelligence. That's uh, super ambitious, uh, actually. Um, so in February, she wants to have a law presented on uh, ethical AI, but there is no consultation process even started yet. Uh, I would say that's not not possible, that uh, thing. But the real kicker is this wonderful gem of a quote, digitalization and cyber are two sides of the same coin. What does that even mean? It sounds like straight out of a science fiction um, story, cyber. What does it mean? Maybe the French-speaking people in the room would say, yeah, that's because English is not the best uh, language for international communication. We should have stuck to French, uh, the, the, the language of uh, international diplomacy. But it doesn't really make more sense in French either. Les numérisions et les cyberspace sont les deux faces d'une même médaille. What does she actually mean by that? It becomes a little, little, little more clearer in the German, where they talk about digitalization and computer and network security are two sides of the same coin. So it is about cyber security. So that kind of cyber we are talking about. We are not talking about cyber um, I don't know, as an aesthetic movement where you uh, wave around neon tubes a lot, uh, we're talking about cyber security. And that phrase struck me as a little odd, so I went searching, where does this odd phrase come from? Let's ask Google, and I find um, many results that have something with Siemens.com attached to it. Actually, they are, seem to be the only ones who are using that. They even had a, an interview, why is digitalization and cybersecurity two sides of the same coin? Uh, interview with uh, Siemens CEO Joe Kaysner. Of course, she didn't prepare it herself. It was written into that document by someone, and it is just an incorrectly shortened Siemens slogan. Digitalization and cyber are two sides of the same coin. It's not a mysterious phrase after all. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for your talk. I'm very excited for the next talk because I don't know nothing about it but its speaker. Uh, please greet Fukami Fukami for introducing Deep. Hello. Hi. 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 Okay. Yeah, uh, hello, it's about yeah, uh, I'm Fukami. I live in Brussels since five years now. And uh, the talk is about, I would say, the experience that I had over the last five years. Uh, being involved into EU politics, and it's like it's it's a uh, like uh, like, uh, like we we uh, keep in that space for a moment longer. So what I learned over the last five years basically are uh, things that are also connected to what Jens already said. It's uh, language. So 
we often, like as technicians, when you are when you are involved in policy uh, things, it's very often about uh, the the difference of meanings uh, in in terms. Let's say, for example, if a politician or uh, a social scientist or political scientist talk about algorithm, what they mean is basically, yeah, like a, a synonym for uh, for. Um, automation, while uh, a technician or like an engineer, an, uh, for another algorithm is a solution. So it's a completely different thing that we are talking about. So why does it matter? It matters because um, policy is all about expressing ideas and uh, trying to change uh, the society uh, for the good. And I. Uh, what I learned uh, as a good thing in Brussels is that I have the feeling that everybody wants to do the right thing. So, yeah, Brussels. Um, what, what I learned over the last five years in terms of influencing EU policy is there is on, on, on one hand there are a couple of groups, uh, they are tied to especially digital rights like you know, data protection, free speech, net neutrality and uh, open knowledge or like free, free knowledge and, and um, there are a couple of groups that deal with it but when it comes to the real technical parts or, or more like you know, cyber security or also artificial intelligence or other discussions that are more uh, that have a deeper technical um, approach, uh, it's, it's very difficult to actually have uh, a good conversation. And um, what we want to uh, do is to um, get uh, a new organization started called DEEP, which stands for Digital Expertise in European Politics. And what we want to do is to get technicians closer to the Brussels bubble um, to do two things. One thing is to influence policy before it gets, you know, uh, before the proposals uh, get issued by the European Commission, so being involved into uh, uh, um, the, the, the phases before that, so green paper, white papers, as well as the consultations. And on the other hand, um, helping educating policy makers, so not so much politicians, because politicians uh, get uh, elected uh, only for a, short, uh, a certain amount of time, but the people who actually write all this, the things, so it's basically the staff of the European Parliament or the Commission or the Council, um, and uh, starting discussions with them and, and uh, helping them to understand uh, the gist of the technical um, things in order to influence uh, the policy at the end. Right now, so we are we are just really in the in the in the first uh, um, like phase of it, which is all about money and how yeah how how we can actually um, get that together. And we are still in between that or like in the middle of the discussion uh, because it. Uh, um, one thing that I also realized is that on one hand we have basically American companies uh, and the industry lobbying uh, yeah, with like American uh, um, industry money. On the other hand, we have the civil society that is basically um, paid by uh, American um, foundations. So that has to, be, that has to change. Um, and we are discussing how to actually change that, which is a longer discussion that, uh, than uh, what, what is possible to do here in five minutes. Um, so uh, I'm at the About Freedom uh, Village. My name is Fukami, and I would like to talk to you guys how to actually fix that in the future. Thank you very much. Fukami, and now to something completely different from a very interesting imperative. Draw the internet. Please come to the stage. Hi, Chaos family. Okay, thanks. Right, so I'd like to share some thoughts about drawing the internet. I basically, the last year, I um, asked a very simple question to 
kids in two different countries. And the simple question was, um, the, I should mention these kids were between 6 and 12, so this is, in Belgium this is primary school. I gave them one simple assignment, as I mentioned. Draw the internet. Um, and I explicitly chose to include the word internet because I wanted to be inspired, I wanted to be have the future generation, our children, to inspire me, what are we doing on the web that we're building right now? Like, we have this, a lot of talk about what is the internet, where is it going, where did it came from, what is the web, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to, like, project myself into what do these younger people think about internet. Um, my name is Dries, you can reach me on these channels. I'm part of the Fright Camp Village, and Fright Camp is a family-friendly hacker camp, which we do in Belgium every two years. Uh, and, and this is very much on that ethos, the inspiration very much came from what I experienced as a co-organizer of this camp. Um, I did a first collection of drawings, so I had a first collection of drawings from kids in Belgium. This is in winter 2018. And then I traveled to Senegal um, in February 2019, so pretty recently, and I did the same experiment, because I wanted to know what does it cultural influence on internet perception is. And I just want to share a couple of these results now. Uh, so this is a very typical kind of thing that came out a couple of times. Um, this, this reads, just like other space, the internet is infinite. And this boy, uh, age 12, he made a drawing of planets. So I found this in infinity kind of thing. It's pretty inspiring, I, I believe. Um, this is someone from Senegal. And it, it, you, you see like the, the level of, of abstraction is, is so much higher. Uh, the super interesting thing in Senegal was that uh, kids, when you mention the word internet, the word does not really exist in their culture but I'll get back to that later. So the, the level of extraction just becomes a lot higher. A lot of colors, of course, you like the, the use of color, that inspired me in this drawing. Um, this was interesting, this is a result from Belgium. Um, like, intertangled wires. It's uh, someone aged seven, and, and this is what it's in their mind when the word internet is mentioned, which I think is cool. Um, Again, age six, you ask them to draw internet. It's like, yeah, what, what, what will they come up with? And they tend to draw like people and, and connections between people. Like you see the curly lines between the heads of the people, like they're connected somehow. And then there's like a little heart, um, which I think is super cool and super fun. Um, this was interesting. Um, in Senegal, a lot of the kids, they draw um, devices, like, because there is like, they never, in that country never had computers or the introduction of computers of computing as we have it uh, in Europe, for instance. Uh, so there it's like mobile is the default. They would draw mobile devices. It's phones and tablets and there's, there's like nothing else. Uh, that's their way to access this, this way of connecting. And what I liked about this drawing were the little dots around the the phone or the, the tablet, I think it's a phone that was drawn here. So the little dots for me, they meant like, this just like extends beyond the device. I'm not really sure whether that was the intention of the drawing, but that was my interpretation of it. Um, this is a very typical Belgian result, where kids would draw their interpretation of um, YouTube or other video sharing platforms. I like the spelling of Google here, very Belgian. Um, this was again a result from Senegal. I want to jump ahead a bit. Um, so the first thing that we saw, like as a conclusion, what did come out of this? Like the first critical conclusion was age evolution. Younger kids would draw like super out there drawings. Like it would be totally crazy stuff really. Whereas as they grow older, their bias just gets so much more narrow. Their thinking gets so much more narrow. They draw Fortnite or they draw YouTube or they draw um, Google images. So they're, they're like evolving towards that. The last thing is that in Senegal, internet does not exist. People talk about communication and connecting. And that for me is the core message of this. Internet is something that connects us and we shouldn't be talking that, about that as something digital per se. Thank you so much.
The next talk is kitspace.org, one-click orders for open source hardware electronics. Right, hello. My name is Casper, and uh, I'm the creator and main maintainer of kitspace.org, which is a website for sharing electronics projects. Um, click on. Oh, did I go too far now? Okay. Um, so, apologies. I, uh, this is a PDF in this presentation. It's supposed to be a website with videos, and that did, all of that didn't work out, and it's not completely updated because I wasn't aware of <laughs> and how it works at the camp. Um, but the way electronics are made uh, is you have a printed circuit board, and you have parts that you sold onto a uh, printed circuit board. So you have through-hole components that kind of poke the legs through, and if this was working, you'd see a nice video of that. Um, uh, you have surface mount devices, and if, if you'd see a nice picture of that, if uh, I had prepared better. Um, and uh, so, surface mount is when the components sit on top of the board rather than going through. Uh, you can the, the, one of the best ways to do this is to get a hacked toaster oven, uh, or one of the cheapest ways to do this is hack a toaster oven and uh, use a solder paste. Uh, and heat up the board carefully, and then your parts kind of, the, the solder reflows and your parts get soldered on. If you want to know more about that, check out your local hack space. Uh, of course, there's loads of workshops here at the camp as well to learn more about that. So the way electronics are designed is on one side, you have a, a schematic layout tool where you define all the connections that you want between your components. And then you have the PCB, uh, the PCB layout tool where you then actually route the connections on a physical model of your board. And loads of people are doing this, and they're sharing them free, freely online. You can find loads of projects online uh, that you could try and remake. Um, this, this is just a kind of informal survey that I've, that I've done uh, of projects. And of course, they're, they're, more and more projects are going up, and there's other sources for these as well. Uh, the problem with it is that uh, often you, when you come across a project, it's kind of hard to get to that point that you want to get to of having the parts and having the, the board. So it's kind of, they, they all have different structures and different, some of them are more like blogs, some of them are uh, file repositories, and uh, it's hard to find your way around f to get to the point. So. The, uh, w what you really would like to do is go from there, and you want the board, and you want the parts. So this is what uh, I've been trying to do with these projects. Uh, one part is kidspace.org. It's a project sharing website. But even earlier than that, I started. what I started with was a browser extension that helps y you buy parts. So it quickly it automates parts purchasing for you. Uh, uh, so it, it can automate the typical kind of component distributors like DigiKey, Mauser, RS, and um, it does this by by replicating the web requests that you would, if you were clicking around the site, those sites yourself, the browser extension does that for you. So you can have a, a list of components and you put it into the browser extension and it puts it into your shopping cart. Uh, there's a video of that which is not going to work, unfortunately. Uh, it's available for Chrome and Firefox. You can just use it without kitspace.org by yourself with a spreadsheet, and you can lo load other build builds and materials online somewhere as well. Um, so the other part to this is, the, of course, you want the board, and you want to make a complete project. So that's what kitspace.org is for. Kitspace presents the whole project uh, together with the boards and a README and a detailed uh, bill of materials and buttons on there where you can just click and it hooks up to the extension and you can then get all the parts for someone's project. Uh, the way you add a project on Kitspace currently is you set up your own Git repository somewhere, GitHub or GitLab or your own server, and then you, s you submit a pull request to the Kitspace project and say you want to add yours and um, you then 
it, it, it gets added. So uh, the idea really is to have this, this, this virtual kit. So the creators can make their design and put it up online, and you can buy it independ independently yourself. So there are a few interesting projects that I would love to have time to talk about, to, cause, but I don't. So come find me around camp. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to our next talk. It's called Android. Privacy is not a luxury. Please. Hi, I'm Christopher Weatherhead. I work for uh, Privacy International. And I thought you might like this talk. Um, it's a little bit of a, a preview of some ongoing research we're currently doing. Um, and I kind of need your help with it. So I'll come to that in the end. And uh, yeah, I should give you a little bit of an introduction. So we're doing some work on pre-installed Android apps and this the general like privacy problems with them. This is based on some recent research by a group of academics who did a um, who looked who looked and analysed the domain and uh, did an analysis on uh, one thousand over one thousand seven hundred devices from two hundred different vendors and found only nine percent of the apps that are pre-installed on those devices appear in the Play Store or the Google Play Store. Uh, which makes this domain really hard to analyze. So we're trying to uh, get some like case studies and some stories about this so we can put pressure on Google because this, this area needs better regulation from what is essentially Google the gatekeeper. Um, and our interest is that these apps are often installed on low-end, low-cost phones, and, and this disproportionately affects people who have uh, those devices. So what are the problems with this? Well, the first one's around um, consent. Pre-installed apps are, as they, as, they, <laughs> as they say, they're pre-installed. So they often come with things like custom permissions. Um, some of those custom permissions can bypass Android's own security policy. Uh, the, uh, because they're pre-installed, often these permissions are pre-accepted, so they can access things like the microphone, camera, and location without prompting the user. And uh, some of these uh, custom permissions are particularly nefarious in that they can do things like uh, access text messages, read other applications information, uh, and also they can initiate calls and receive calls. Um, which is a bit problematic. There's also a lack of control for the end user. Uh, the user often can't delete these apps. Um, they run in the background, and especially in low-cost contexts where the, the the cost of data is high. You know, these could be secretly like working in the background, sucking data, um, and that data could be going to all sorts of third parties. And it, it's really hard to know where that data is going. Um, and also, on less of a privacy point, but on just a general niceness point, these, device, these, often, uh, these apps are using uh, space on a device that usually has very limited space. And finally, from, even from our own analysis of uh, the security practices, they're usually woeful. Uh, they can have things like um, sending personal information over unencrypted channels, so sending things like personal information uh, names and uh, details along with things like the IMEI of the phone over HTTP. Uh, that's always nice. And then some of the apps we've even had a look at have vulnerabilities, uh, arbitrary code execution. And this is, this is really bad in, when it comes to pre-installed apps because of the, um, some of them have these permissions that are outside of the Android security model. So once you're in, you're pawning, basically. Uh, so, oh, and finally, on the uh, security side, obviously, some of these phones are still being sold as new with Android 4.2.2 or Android 5, which has got known critical vulnerabilities in it. So what is our solution? Well, we're trying to put pressure on Google, particularly, to, to, put more cert uh, to better certify these, uh, uh, these manufacturers' devices, because they have such a controlling influence in the ecosystem. Um, we like Google to be clearer as to what a certified partner has, to, what thresholds they have to actually cross to uh, get their app certified and pre-installed on a phone. Um, and then also, they should, they should not, they should not uh, authorize phones that have, uh, that have permissions which void the Android security model. Uh, from a deletion perspective, users should be able to delete their apps. That seems pretty sensible. 
Um, and this goes on from, uh, from our C, uh, 35C3 talk, which was on a, on a separate topic about Facebook. We'd also like to see uh, Google ha in implement a centralized privacy hub where you can control not just your app permissions and your, uh, 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 but also your advertising uh, data and that kind of stuff. So you can ban trackers or you can globally ban things from accessing your camera, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in this and you'd like to help out, uh, please come and contact me. That's all my contact details. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. And could you please leave the clicker? Thank you so much. So the next speaker up here is AnyKey with OpenSCAD, making 3D objects by code. Was the clicker? Ah. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, hope you're all enjoying camp. Uh, my name is Aniki. Uh, I'm a self-taught maker, and I think I got 10 years ago my first uh, 3D printer, the Cupcake CNC machine. And since then, I've been involved in the 3 pre 3D printing scene and that kind of stuff. And one thing that actually has always amazed me is that how many people have 3D printers, and I, if I ask them, hey, what do you make with it, or what do you design with it, they don't. They just print other people's stuff. Um, and then I ask them why. Well, most people don't know how to draw, or at least not electronically and that kind of stuff. Neither do I, but I do know how to code. So I want to talk about how you can actually use your coding skills to actually make 3D objects. And that's something done by something called OpenSCAD. OpenSCAD, whatever you want to call it. I have absolutely no affiliation with this uh, project whatsoever. I'm just a fan, a uh, user of it. Uh, it's open source. You can run it on your Mac, Linux, whatever machine you have, even on a Raspberry Pi. And by using code, you can actually or take a DXF file, a 2D design file, and turn it into a 3D file, or completely from scrap, create objects. So you can start very simply by saying, okay, I, I want to have a cube. Um, and then you just give a command called a cube, 10 by 10 by 10, and you have a 3D cube in space. And you can see from the syntax, it's somewhat like C language based. So it's, if you're familiar with programming an Arduino or something like that, you'll, you'll find the syntax to be very familiar. Uh, and there are all kinds of other shapes that you can make. You can make a cylinder. Um, you can actually make a cylinder with the top and the bottom radius to be different. So you get a cone uh, and all those kinds of things you can actually make. But as it is a programming language, you can actually do operations with these things. So I can take that cube, and I can take that cylinder, and by putting a, a difference command around it, it actually always first draws the first object within the difference command, and anything else than what I specify, it actually subtracts from it. So I end up, in this case, with a cube with a hole uh, through it. And whatever other objects I add within that difference command, it starts subtracting that. One other method that you can actually draw more complex shapes, something that I actually use a lot, is I can put, for instance, a few cylinders um, in a particular order. So I'm using the cylinder command here, and I use a translate command to actually place it somewhere in space. So uh, a particular order, and in this case, like a triangle. Now, I have these three cylinders. By just simply putting a whole command around it, it makes a 3D object of that outline uh, of that shape. Now, if I want to have maybe holes in this triangle, I can take those exact same three cylinders, just shorten the radius a little bit, but keeping them on the same space, and use my difference command, and I end up having a nice triangular plate with rounded corners, with holes in it, and all that kind of stuff. But the nice thing about all of this is, is it's a programming language, so you can really make the benefits of having a programming language. So when I design stuff, uh, I'm very impatient, I very quickly want to make something and then I'll find out everything that's wrong about it and I'll go back and fix it. You can do that all with parameters. So in the pro beginning of my program, I define my parameters uh, that I'll probably later know that I will have to change. Um, and I make modules for these uh, objects to make my code very simple and very readable. And this is really how you can leverage the power. You can loops and all those kinds of things to really make very complex things with just a few lines of code. Now, even you might not have ever heard of the existence of OpenSCAD, if you have ever visited Thingiverse, you probably have been in contact with these kind of OpenSCAD files. If you go to Thingiverse, the website to download 3D objects from, you can select on something called customizable. Anything that is customizable means it is actually written in OpenSCAD. And therefore, anything that's written in OpenSCAD, even on Thingiverse itself, um, uh, that is customizable, you can even in the web page, 
um, change uh, therefore. So for instance, in this example, this is a cylinder slot. Uh, you want to change the code on how to open up the slot. You don't have to know how to program. You don't have to download even open SCAD whatsoever in Fingerverse website. You see there, there are four variables for the numbers that you want to have for the object, uh, and it will automatically adjust the code. But what's the great thing? On that same page, you find the button View Source. So you can actually see the source code on how this object was created by that person. And all that person does is, in the beginning, specify those variables. Those variables, therefore, are picked up by Thingiverse to show it into a nice web interface. And then you can take all that code that is in existence there. So let me give you some examples that are out there. Um, if you, for instance, uh, lost your keys, well, key, not if you lost your keys, if you only have one key left and you need more keys, uh, someone with an, uh, an OpenSCAD program that you can take a photo of your camera, uh, of your key, uh, it will analyze it and automatically translate it into an actual 3D printable key, so you can have spare keys. Um, other projects, oh, uh, someone made a, a customizable thing for on your laptop to, uh, that you don't have to put a silly sticker on it or something like that, but then you can make something nice with your name on it or something like that to hide your camera. Uh, someone made it for quick set keys. If you have a quick set key, I actually tested this last week, uh, you can just uh, type in the code and you, uh, you get it. So hopefully I've given you some ideas and uh, co-create and make something and share. Thank you. So the next talk is about introducing neurodiversity by Jontje. Is Jontje here? Yeah. Come on stage. Please. Yeah. So also the speakers for the next session, please get ready on the talk before you so we can change the stage quickly and now you have the stage, Jontje. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, neurodiversity. Um, what exactly is that? Um, well, there's neuro in it, so it's got to have something to do with neurology, and it does. Um, and it's, in fact, the diversity of the neurology of our brain. What does that have to do with computers? Well. Not much, except if you view the brain as one giant computer. Um, so yeah, the concept is basically that all humans have a different neurological makeup. And there's, of course, going to be some variety about that, and um, from which we have obviously profited as humans across our entire existence. Um, but there has been in the last decade or so a trend of putting that, uh, taking that concept or the fact that uh, there's a certain variance and turning that, slowly narrowing the concept of what we define as normal and so creating basically Ill illnesses or disorders. And uh, so what exactly falls into that, for example, um, the concept of autism or ADHD or, or uh, bipolar disorder or many of these other um, yeah, things that we usually define as mental illnesses or disorders and are currently trying to cure are actually not that. Um, they are things that humans have done over, uh, or human brains have done over our entire existence. And there's proof of that. There's proof, for example, in Stone Age art that there were people with specific processing dis uh, differences. And those are the same that uh, autistic people most likely, uh, or most of them, uh, exhibit. So we can, with pretty, sh uh, with pretty surely say that there were autistic people in Stone Age, so should we really be trying to cure something that has existed over all this time and has in fact been positively selected by genetics? Um, so the idea that uh, many of these things um, that we define as disorders uh, might not be, uh, of course, uh, calls into question our concept of 
what is normal. And in fact, that concept is just a concept and not something that is somehow defined in nature. Um, and that doesn't necessarily invalidate the experiences of people, of autistic people or uh, ADHD people or whatever, um, but it defines how we treat them. Um, and it is the concept of neurodiversity is uh, related to the concept of uh, to the social model or concept of disability, which means that some things that are disab disabilities in our current culture um, are only disabilities because our culture is built in a certain way. Um, so, for example, being deaf or hard of hearing is only a disability, and some deaf or hard of hearing people do not define themselves as disabled um, because we talk with speech and we need to hear it. Um, and in fact, that has not always been true. Many uh, linguist, linguists now um, think that the first language that when humans first started to well, develop language um, was actually a sign language. So even the concept that we need to talk is not, it's just based that on the fact that most of our cultures talk, but not all of them. So what does neurodiversity have to do with the internet and, well, most of the things that we're talking about here? Um, well, first of all, for the neurodiversity, neurodiversity movement and for many people who are neurodiverse in some way, whether they're autistic or ADHD or bipolar or whatever, um, the emergence of the internet and especially the emergence of social media has um, been, well, a radical uh, change in our lives um, because there's it's new modes of commu communication and, yeah. Thank you very much. The next talk uh, is coming with AI-powered robots in real life by How. Don't give up trying. Just. All right. So um, my name is How. Uh, I founded this company called Dorabot five years ago. Um, this is about uh, to show you what the state of art of AI and how they get applied to robots that actually work in real life. So there are about 50 slides, uh, bear with me. Now, uh, what's AI? There's a one definition of AI is thinking or acting rationally. And AI is used very widely. To the left um, is what AI is used 30 years ago, which is recognizing handwritten digits. And what AI can do now uh, is identifying each of the uh, cars in a picture and then actually separating them. So they know they are different cars. And uh, there are a bunch of other applications of AI. Uh, the AI can play Go, beat the top, top human player. Uh, AI can allow you to go into a store, pick up item, and then leave uh, without uh, waiting in the line for, trick, uh, for, for checking. Right? So you don't need to pay with your credit card and stuff. The AI just recognizes who you are and what item you pick up uh, as you go. And then uh, we have robots that move shelves in the warehouses to kind of uh, ship stuff that you buy ordered online. And AI can recognize stuff in the video, uh, w w whether, uh, whether or not this part of the video is a car or is a human. Uh, AI can recommend you similar products that uh, you've searched for can tell you where you should drive uh, on a map, right? can fetch a cup of coffee for you, operate a coffee machine, and can generate you know, different uh, kind of synthetic or generate or replace a face of a character onto another one that you cannot distinguish as a human, uh, can synthetic new faces based on source pictures. Right? So the, uh, the people's face on the bottom right, is, they don't exist, right? they are synthetic human. Um, the best, this is my favorite, AI can actually beat a uh, human StarCraft player uh, already uh, by just, well, these are the uh, visualization of how the neural network works. So um, if you're interested, the slide is online, uh, this reference book about AI, and a robot is a machine that can carry out physical tasks, basically, and uh, there are just differences 
between the, uh, the robots before versus the robot now. Basically, robot nowadays with AI equipped can work in more unstructured or dynamic environment versus the robot before can only work in structured environment that's programmed. Now, previously we do 2D vision, now we can do 3D. Uh, previously, the mobile robot have to follow lines on the ground. Now we can navigate freely in any environment. Uh, previously, you have to use a teach pendant or remote control to program the robot. Now we can actually have the robot uh, compute its own path automatically. And previously, we have rigid robot. Now we have collaborative robot that even if it hits you, it doesn't break your bones. Now, uh, to the left is what I built in 2012 in uh, Noise Bridge in San Francisco. Uh, to the right is uh, after the company is established, it will be built um, uh, in 2017. So both are mobile multiplayer. And all the following are how they can get uh, applied. So this is a gripper. Uh, it's a dexterous hand, it's mimicking human hand. It can grasp balls. It can uh, run, uh, kind of operate a screwdriver. It can kind of put salt on a plate. Uh, we can also have the mobile multiplayer draw pictures, uh, operating coffee machine, making dumplings, uh, picking items from the shelf directly. And uh, this is how it works. So basically, the, uh, it shows how the robot evaluates the environment around it and then figure out how to grasp an item. So how do we apply it to real life, right? So um, one, one of the options is uh, conference service. So I just came from uh, Macau uh, in this international joint international conference of AI. And then uh, we, we put robot in use. So we have uh, uh, conference participants present their badge to the robot, and then the robot fetches the souvenir, and then presented the souvenir to the, uh, to the participant. Uh, we have people lining up for receiving the souvenir from robot. Uh, we have a coffee pouring robot, so we have a barrel with coffee, and then if the robot sees you stands in front of it, it pulls the lever on the coffee bar barrel, and then kind of present you with uh, the cup of coffee. And uh, this is my favorite part. So essentially what's happening is we have mobile robots running around in the uh, reception, and have, uh, 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 so we, we have them serving drinks, but then they soon become a uh, garbage collection robot because people just put place on them. And uh, this is what the company is mainly about. We actually put robot in uh, logistics, so loading boxes into trailers, sorting packages, uh, different ways of sorting packages, different ways of sorting items that's not in a package, and all this stuff. And then, uh, yeah, so. If uh, you are interested, talk to me. This is my contact. Thanks. Thank you very much. Dear audience, I'm, I'm very shy and don't like to interrupt people. That's why I need your help. So, but I don't think uh, we need your help for the next speaker because I'm very, very happy to have Ben here on stage. I'm very happy he could be convinced to be here. The next talk will be in German. And it's Ben, 10 Jahre Doodle an der TU Dresden, ein Resumé. Ja, hallo. Okay, also 10 Jahre Doodle. Ich nehme mal an, es wissen wenige Leute, was Doodle ist. Wer weiß, was Doodle ist? Das, das Doodle, was hier steht, das D-U-D-L-E. Hey, ein paar. Cool. Ähm, dann, wer weiß, was das hier ist? Doodle. Das wissen hoffentlich alle so ungefähr. Genau. Also es geht eigentlich um, da, um sowas, und zwar eine Event-Scheduling-Applikation. Ähm, wir haben sowas in Dresden nachgebaut. Das sieht dann so aus, eigentlich ziemlich ähnlich zu den ganzen Sachen, wie es ähm, Original-Doodle ist. Ähm, allerdings, was wir gemacht haben, ist ein ähm, Haufen Krypto-Features reingepackt. Das ist jetzt zehn Jahre her. Damals war das noch cool und neu. Heute gibt es sowas mit CryptPad und mit CryptBin. Und ähm, ja, es gibt so ein paar Applikationen. Das nennt sich alles Zero Zero Proof oder Zero Footprint Application. Ähm, die Idee ist einfach nur, dass man im, mit JavaScript Sachen verschlüsselt und dann verschlüsselt auf dem Server speichert. Und da gibt es verschiedene Protokolle, in denen das passiert und genau sowas haben wir also, also gemacht. Ähm, wie gesagt, zehn Jahre her. Wenn euch das mehr interessiert, dann hier schaut euch die Vorträge an. Das äh, habe ich schon ein paar Mal vorgetragen. Einmal ähm, auf dem Camp 2011 und auf dem CCC 2009 und auf den Datenspuren, äh, die bald wieder sind, ähm, in Dresden. Genau, äh, da gibt es Videos dazu, könnt ihr euch genau die Features anschauen. So, und jetzt ist es zehn Jahre her, jetzt ähm, stellen wir uns die Frage, nach, was ist denn jetzt passiert seitdem? Ähm, die Sache ist die, wir ähm, haben so ein paar, ich habe einfach ein paar Statistiken zusammengesammelt. Die Umfragen werden alle drei Monate gelöscht, das heißt, sie sind nur drei Monate auf dem Server drauf. Ähm, und also sie werden nach drei Monaten gelöscht, wenn keiner ähm, sie benutzt mehr. Und... Ähm, 
Ach so, genau, dazu komme ich gleich. Das erste coole Feature ist, mittlerweile gibt es es auf 20 verschiedenen Sprachen. Also ein riesen Dank an die Community. Ja. Ich habe ich hab also in unzähligen Sprachen Submissions bekommen. Das war also unglaublich teilweise, was alles dabei ist. Genau. Ihr könnt noch mehr übersetzen, wenn ihr das wollt. Müsst mir einfach die Dateien schicken. Genau, das nächste, jetzt komme ich eigentlich dazu. Wie gesagt, es wird alle drei Monate gelöscht und ich habe mal gezählt, wie viele Umfragen überhaupt so gescheduled werden und da sind, naja, ich komme auf 130.000 User, die pro Monat das benutzen und sind 12.000 Umfragen, die pro Monat gescheduled werden, also ist doch eine ganz schön große Zahl und jetzt ist es so im Interface, man muss an irgendeiner Stelle, weil also Doodle, das DUDLE steht natürlich für unseren Lehrstuhl Datenschutz und Datensicherheit in Dresden und ähm, wir sind ja keine Usability-Experten, man muss also an irgendeiner Stelle dann klicken, ja, ich möchte die Umfragen symmetrisch mit JavaScript verschlüsseln. Und jetzt die Frage an euch, was denkt ihr von diesen ähm, 12.000 Umfragen, wie viele davon sind verschlüsselt? Wie viele haben auf diesen Button geklickt? Ja, ich möchte die Umfrage verschlüsselt haben. Ah, ich sehe da eine Eins, einer, okay. Ähm, eins, ruft mal rein, wer denkt, was? Zehn Prozent höre ich da? Okay, also, 30 Prozent, ja. Achtung, ich klicke mal auf den nächsten. Ähm, Achso, genau, hier nochmal die Frage. Ja, wie viele waren das? Naja. Äh, okay, was lernen wir daraus? Na? Wir brauchen Security by Design und Privacy by Design. Das funktioniert anders. Nee, also das, wenn ihr die, die Leute nee, die Leute benutzen das, weil sie denken, hey, cool, das ist ja verschlüsselt, alles toll. Ähm, aber weil wir die Features erst danach eingebaut haben und äh, das erstmal getestet haben und dann haben wir es nie wieder geändert. Dadurch ist es... Ja, so wenig geblieben. Aber gut, ähm, so ist das. Genau, jetzt habe ich noch ein paar, ich habe noch genug Zeit, ich habe noch so ein paar Fun Facts vorbereitet, äh, also eigentlich zwei. Das erste, ich hatte es ja schon gesagt, hier solche E-Mails hatte ich öfter bekommen, insgesamt ähm, einige. Äh, ich benutze gerne Doodle und möchte gerne was zurückgeben, deshalb habe ich eine Übersetzung angefertigt. Und so sieht das dann aus. Use this option if you see the characters in parentheses. Ähm, benutzte die Option, wenn sie durch Zeicher in der Klammer sehr kenne. Ah, ich kann nicht so gut Schwäbisch. Habe ich noch nicht eingebaut, aber das äh, kommt noch. Ähm, genau, das nächste ist, äh, wenn man eine Umfrage löschen muss, äh, löschen will, damit man sich dann nicht ins Knie schießt und nicht versehentlich den Button drückt, muss man erstmal sowas eingeben. Ne? Also ähm, hier muss man eingeben, yes, I know what I'm doing, in das Textfeld einfach rein reinschreiben, damit man auch sicher die Umfrage löscht. Da gibt es ein paar Strings, zum Beispiel, please delete this poll, I'm aware of the consequences und so verschiedene Sachen. Und klar, wenn man sich vertippt, dann löscht er die Umfrage nicht. Ne? Also wenn man bei I hate these stupid entry fields eingibt, I don't like these stupid entry fields, dann zeigt er an, ähm, ja, dass es das nicht geht. So, ähm, Achtung vor solchen Features, ich habe diese E-Mail bekommen, die lasse ich einfach mal hier stehen, weil die Zeit ist eh klar rum. Ähm, ja, okay. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Also, die ging dann über die Pressestelle an den Prof und der sollte sich rechtfertigen vom Rektor, warum er solche Wörter benutzt. Das war Spaß. Gut. Thank you. The next talk is Gemeinnütz is also in German. It's Gemeinnütz. Software entwickeln bei Mo. Oh, hello. My name is Mo. I actually decided on the last minute to give the talk in English, uh, so uh, more people can enjoy uh, what I'm going to tell you. Um, so. I want to take this opportunity to tell you about a great milestone uh, that we achieved uh, just last week. So this is really like nice uh, and hot stuff. But I also want to thank everyone who was involved in the creation of uh, and in the process of this uh, project. Uh, the conversation around it started uh, taking shape in 2011, 2012, and it took a while before we reached the state uh, in 2016, where we started uh, by creating a legal entity. Um, so I don't really see my slides, so I don't know what's going on. Um, ah. There are the slides. So in 2016, we uh, created uh, um, uh, an entity 
uh, called the Center for the Cultivation of Technology. Um, uh, what, what is it? It's a German non-profit limited li liability company. Uh, so it's something that you don't see that often. Usually people create Gemeinnützige Vereine. Uh, this is a, is a company, but it's also a charity. Um, and what does this charity do? The charity is a legal host for open source projects. So whenever projects have to interact with money, they need some kind of way of making the money flow. And uh, we provide a legal entity that you can pick and choose um, uh, to um, help you with your money. Um, uh, this is the quote from the bylaws, uh, and this is uh, leading to what milestone we reached. So we created a legal entity that um, says in the bylaws that the goal of the, of the organization is to develop and uh, further the f free and open technologies. And bear with me, this is not a perfectly fine definition for everything else, but this is targeted towards the tax authorities. Because we have to argue why are we a charity, why are we doing stuff that is beneficial to the public. And uh, before we started this, I talked to many different lawyers, I talked to many different organizations, and everyone was like, uh, maybe development of software cannot be a charitable activity. Um, so we tried, we set out uh, to do it, um, and uh, this is kind of what we, some of the kind of services that we are providing to our projects, we are not done yet, so this is an in-progress conversation. Uh, we want to help people with their donation processing, uh, we help uh, projects with um, um, grants and other supporting contracts. Um, uh, but we also um, look at the side of, okay, there's money coming into the project. How does the team make decisions around spending the money? Uh, how can the project create some transparency towards the people giving money and also towards the team itself? So that's a big part of what we are building, is kind of a management platform for similar organizations. They might be in completely different spaces, they might be around political activism or other fields where you want to share a legal entity across many different projects. Um, so um, we started in October uh, 2016 to register the entity, so the first business year was October, November, December 2016. Uh, in 2016 we um, started slowly doing stuff, um, but the real first business year was 2017, and uh, this was a crucial kind of a phase because you the, how the tax authorities evaluate your charity status is based on previous activities. So they look into the past, you finalize the full year, you submit the documents, you submit an annual report explaining what you did, and then you wait. And this was the phase the past months. We submitted uh, a while ago the 2017 filings, and you can see some numbers here. So in our first official business year, we already um, had 800,000 uh, euros in money coming in to projects that we host. Um, we spent 142 uh, kilo euros on employment, uh, so we can provide employment for people in case they want that. Um, and we paid 149 kilo euros to um, contractors that develop software. And this is the achievement, it's the confirmation of our charity status. Thank you. So, the next talk is going about a digital climate strike. It's held by Blip. Is Blip here? Yes. Please, come up to the stage. And use the... Click it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. We are in the midst of a climate crisis. We cannot longer call it just global warming. It's a fully-fledged crisis. Temperatures rise, huge areas of ice glaciers have melted already, species get extinct, insect populations um, decrease, 
our ecosystem is experiencing huge harm. And for us humans, this is dangerous, not just for the animals and the planet, but also for us. Areas will get inhabitable, new illnesses will rise with the rising temperatures. The reason for all this has been known for decades and is confirmed by scientists. We have been and still are emitting too many greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We are just burning too much fossil fuel, too much oil, too much gas. We have been... Wow. Yeah, some insects still live on my arm, so that's a good sign. But well. We have been externalizing costs on the environment for too long. And science shows that we cannot continue like this. We need to be carbon neutral by 2025. This is in almost five years. Individual actions are not enough to change this. We need large-scale change. We need governments to change policies. Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion and other organizations have been calling for the next international climate strike on September 20 this year. This is in a month. Please go participate in the strike, go out on the street, tell your friends and family and co-workers. And now finally coming to what you can see on this slide. Please consider joining the strike on the internet. If you run a website or a blog or a social media profile, consider blacking out or greening out your website, display a different avatar to raise awareness for the International Climate Strike Week that will start on September 20 and continue until September 27. You can find some resources on these three internet uh, websites I put on my slide, shutdownforclimate.net, shutdownforclimate.de for a German version, and soon also digitalclimatestrike.net, which is not yet online. There is templates for these blackout sites, there is a WordPress plugin, there will be more soon. So pl please let the internet participate in the strike. Uh, here on the camp, I help co-organizing the Bits and Trees village, Bits und Bäume. We are the sustainability village on camp, so if you're interested in what we do here, come to the About Freedom cluster. Today at 4 p.m. we will have a panel where a lot of organizations will present themselves, amongst others Fridays for Future Extinction Rebellion, C3 Sustainability that tries to make CCC events more sustainable. So please come by, have a look, and if you're motivated to help, please join us. Thanks. The next talk is Open Science and Open Robotics, the Pocket Science Lab. I'm going to talk about a Pocket Science Lab. Um, some of you might know it already. It's an open hardware device, and um, since recently you can also use it for robotics. Um, the whole story of the Open Pocket Science Lab started in 2014 when Praveen came to the FOSS Asia Summit at that year in uh, Cambodia. We ran it at that time in Phnom Penh, and he introduced the idea of an open hardware device for experiments, uh, specifically for physics. So the first versions of uh, open uh, of this open hardware uh, look like this. Um, yeah, it was the Arduino Uno form factor, and we continuously developed it. Later on, it got uh, this size that we also use today. Um, so today, it also supports Bluetooth. Um, you can attach a Wi-Fi module for the ESP8266. There are many small enhancements. Um, recently, we even um, uh, achieved to attach more. 
um, uh, digital pins, for example, so you can run more devices at the same time um, and uh, yeah, more sensors. So this is how it looks like. It's developed together uh, with the FOSS Asia community and uh, Open Tech in Germany. Um, we produce last, large batches um, in Germany and in China, so um, try to also make it sustainable and available for everyone. There are many uh, useful uh, instruments on it, um, so uh, components can be um, attached by pins. We have a desktop app, we have an Android app, and you can build your own apps. We support uh, standards like the UART standard. How it works, you connect it here um, through an app, app, for example, on the mobile phone. Um, there's a USB connection, and you can power the device also through your mobile phone. Then um, you uh, click on these apps um, there, and uh, uh, so they are instruments inside the app that you can access. Um, for example, an oscilloscope, a multimeter, logic analyzer, wave generator, power source, accelerometer, barometer, compass. Um, you can attach a lot of sensors. Any sensor that uh, runs with Arduino will also work with us. And we are adding more and more uh, sensors for gas, for example, PHP, uh, pH meter, and so on. So this is then how the oscilloscope looks like. Um, you see different waves, um, or for example, the power source. Um, here's the multimeter, uh, wave generator, and logic analyzer. You can create um, digital uh, uh, waves with digital uh, instrument or with um, analog instruments. And um, recently, we introduced um, the uh, this instrument um, is actually not to read, uh, it's actually to control um, servos, so small motors, you can have uh, four motors and you can um, yeah, draw here uh, which angle you want and then drag and drop them into a timeline similar to a video editor, so this was really cool. We ran a workshop here in Shenzhen a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, actually May 8, yeah, and uh, you see people really get excited and want to build it and there's a small robot uh, on the table that they try to control with it, so um, that's really something new and cool. Um, another thing that we are doing is uh, you're now able to generate um, uh, config files. Um, you can attach an ESP and then control the device through Wi-Fi and you can leave it offline anywhere and come back um, at some point later and collect the data. Um, so, for example, you can control time interval, you can control channels and so on. So whatever you can do with the app connected, you should also be, do, uh, be able to do it uh, when the app is not connected and come back later and uh, use the device as a complete data logger. Um, yeah, here are a few specs for the experts um, in the room. And there are always a lot of questions. You can find them also on our uh, website. So it's, for example, the, uh, the first question is always how many channels. So we have four channels and uh, we have two MSPS. So um, uh, if you use several um, sensors at the same time, of course, you have to like uh, it's not like every device can have this uh, kind of access you need to separate this so the uh, bottleneck here is basically the usb connection if you use wi-fi actually we can also talk about um, like making it faster making the bandwidth wider and so on but it wasn't needed so far how can you get involved in the project so the whole project is open um, it is free and open so please join us wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Get it to the next speaker. Give to click. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now there is Sophia Saley. We are going to learn something about Olabini. Thank you for you being here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Hello, my name is Sofia Selly, and I'm the partner and colleague of Ulabini. And today I'm going to talk about him because he is uh, unfairly persecuted in Ecuador, which is my, my home country. And he was illegally detained, and right now he's under investigation for the alleged crime of hacking into computer systems. So. The first thing we're talking about, uh, Ulabini is actually asking ourselves who is Ulabini. So Ulabini is a software developer who many times have participated in CCC. Uh, and he mainly works right now on security, cryptography, and privacy, developing software uh, to enhance uh, privacy and security and cryptography, but also on the research in cryptography itself. On the past, he was also a collaborator uh, into several programming languages, especially with the JRuby project, but he has also been around collaborating with other 
security pro uh, project like the Tor project, Enigma project, the Let's Encrypt project. And right now what we are leading is the version 4 of the off-the-record messaging protocol as a cryptographic protocol, but also its implementation. Right now, as I said, he's illegally detained in Ecuador uh, with the alleged crime of hacking into computer systems. But actually, that's, um, it seems to be not actually the crime that he committed, but uh, even the EFF have actually concluded that it's not really, he's not really detained or investigated because of some uh, crime that he committed, but actually because of some political reasons. And um, basically the political reason seems to be that he's a friend of Julian Assange, and uh, as we know, uh, my country, Ecuador, has expelled Julian Assange from the embassy, and ever since then there has been some uh, persecution against, against Ulebini uh, ever since then. So yeah, the next question, of course, that I already talked a little bit about, why is, uh, why is he detained? So how all of this happens is the first question uh, prior to answer the main question. So how all of this happened is on uh, 11 of April, in which the day in which uh, Julian Assange was expelled from the embassy in Ecuador, uh, Ulebini was actually detained in Ecuador when he was uh, at the airport. Um, there was actually no real charges when he was detained. He was just detained because they wanted to detain him. Uh, there was no charges, and apparently, as I said, the only reason why he was, get, uh, he was detained is because of his friendship with Julian Assange. Over the period of his investigation and detention process, a lot of human rights violations has happened. As I said, there's no real charges, so that's a human rights violation. Uh, he didn't have any access to his lawyers. Uh, there was actually no presumption of innocence. He was actually guilt uh, ever since day one that he was actually detained. Uh, he lived in awful cell conditions because he was detained for 72 days in a Latin American prison. And I don't know if you have ever visited a Latin American prison. It's not the best cell conditions. He was actually living there for 72 days. Um, there's an absurdity of actually being him in the preventive prison because uh, actually there's no reason, if there's no real charge where a person should be in preventive prison. Uh, to justify uh, its uh, preventing prison, the Ecuadorian government have actually shown his devices, his laptop, his USB drivers, his UB keys as evidence that he was actually trying to hack into some system. And as, as we know, as people who actually attend the CCC, that's actually very absurd because we all have a lot of devices and that's no evidence that we commit any kind of crime. As evidence, the Ecuadorian government has also shown that uh, he had a lot of English books uh, regarding programming and that was actually something that they show as evidence. So what's the current state? As I said, he was detained in a Latin American prison. He was in prison for 72 days. Uh, after we did uh, an habeas corpus, he was actually released, but that doesn't mean the persecution has stopped because actually he's still under investigation for at least 132 days. Uh, 32 days, uh, 32 more days was added into his investigation because they decided to link someone else to his case so the political persecution can continue. So why should we care? Because this is actually that can happen to anyone who works in the area of research that we work in the area of research of privacy, security, and cryptography. Because this is a misunderstanding from the uh, from any government on the type of field work that we do. Um, because this actually uh, makes our field uh, look like we only do some crimes, but uh, not the kind of research on, on actually pr uh, protecting people and protecting uh, human rights. Um, so that's why should we care? So what can, we, what can you all do as a community? You can retweet with the hashtag FreeOlobini. You can also donate in a GoFundMe uh, page that I didn't put here, but if you want to know exactly the page, come talk to me. You can visit the website freeolobini.org. You can talk about it and you can engage in any kind of way possible. International pressure is something that can definitely help in this case. And with that, thank you very much. You can follow me on Twitter, and if you want to know more information, you can find it under that Twitter, and we will probably do a session on one of the um, workshops someday, so I will put on my Twitter profile if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very please much. Leave clicker, you. Please leave the cl clicker here and uh, bring the microphone please, down. Please be careful. So the next talk is Daniel Brahl with Securing Server-Side Scripting. So hello everyone, um, so I wanted to talk about how to secure un uh, potentially untrusted scripts that run on an enterprise application server in also critical environments. So the company I work for has as customers the uh, big energy companies who run the electrical grid and um, they somehow like security. Uh, even though they want to do something with the loads of data they produce, so they need some, some very uh, sophisticated reporting things and want to plug in a 
as deep as possible, so um, they actually require access to internal API of the Java Enterprise application server that you run. So we provide Groovy scripting on the server um, provided by the users who work in the back office um, to produce all kinds of extensions. So um, what they typically do is something like this. So you iterate through all the dates of the last month, um, get some data from the internal API, and do something sensible with it, like checking whether the measurement is below some limit or so. Um, yeah, but is this really secure? Uh, obviously not. Uh, if you can just write a script like this that, that terminates uh, the, the whole server. So blackout. So um, this would be a denial of service, but you could also think of uh, attacking confidentiality. So here you would bypass the privilege system by just getting every privilege because you have access to this API, and then you read any data. And if you think of um, just creating a uh, network socket is as easy as uh, this. Uh, in this one line, you can send the data uh, to, to some other place where it don't belongs. Um, you could also think of the other way around, manipulating data, attacking integrity. So like here, setting um, some value to 1,000 times the limit. Um, OK, it looks, looks not so scary. But you, if you remember, I said um, this software is potentially running the energy grid of Germany. So this is blackout for everyone. Ah, not so good. So the idea is to restrict to uh, a secure API um, where we know that, that all classes and methods are to be used are really secure and safe, and we cannot bypass authorization. So, um, but how to do this? So the user could still access the full API. Um, and the idea is to, to use um, a library called Groovy Sandbox. So essentially, it allows you to restrict uh, the runtime, uh, what, what kind of imports you use. But then you ask, ah, imports, so why do I need this? So I can do everything at runtime. Everything's evaluated at runtime if you run such a script. So um, for, for instance, you just assign a variable, and you can't uh, efficiently detect this uh, statically. So you can also use some, some shortcuts, some convenience methods. And the only solution can be to, to intercept everything um, like this at runtime. Um, so the idea is that this Groovy Sandbox library allows you to attach interceptors um, at runtime that intercept every method call, array access, object creation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then you would check against the whitelist of uh, allowed classes and methods. Uh, and at best, you also blacklist what's not to be used ever, uh, like losing a class loader or opening uh, network sockets or so. Um, you also have to consider a lot of hard cases that um, convenience methods um, in, in, in a language like Groovy brings. Um, like, for instance, you can just convert some string to uh, a process execution. So in this one-liner, you could just start an additional web server. So um, you have to consider these, these kinds of um, vulnerabilities, too. Uh, and also, uh, you have hard cases where you have a script that just runs forever. Um, and what to intercept here. So there is no method call, there is no variable access, uh, nothing at all. So um, the only possibility here is, is to, to put this in a further sandbox, run it in a separate thread, uh, and, and kill that uh, if, if it takes too long. So how do you kill threads in Java? Um, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, the thing is, um, there is this one method that has been deprecated for over 20 years, and, and all guides on how to uh, do Java programming say don't use it. Um, but this is actually the only thing to do to, to kill something that is just not responding. OK, um, thank you. Um, if, if you have any more questions or, or ideas, so you can talk to me. Uh, you can reach me by mail or uh, here at the camp in the village, uh, faking uh, business route. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next, the next, the next talk is going uh, to be held by BMC Fun and is handling the, the topic of documenting proprietary BMC hardware. Have fun with that. Uh, hi, I'm going to talk about BMCs. Um, so, um, what are BMCs? Um, it's, it means Baseboard Management Controller. It's a bit of a weird name, but it's 
the server inside your server that controls things like power on, power off, um, keyboard, video, mouse, and uh, serial over LAN. And often it has um, direct memory access to the host system. So to your server, which runs applications or whatever, um, and should usually stay secure. Um, so it has a lot, of, a lot of power over the system. Um, like examples include um, ILO from HP Enterprise or um, iDRAC from Dell. Um, this kind of thing we're talking about. Um, this, the security is usually a bit questionable. Um, you have web servers in there doing string copy and scanf without a limit and that kind of stuff. And IPMI, the, the most popular protocol used to access um, BMCs, is kind of designed in the 90s. And um, the authentication is a bit questionable by modern standards. Um, so usually, you, you know from, from SSH, there's public key um, authentication and stuff. And I don't think that's in IPMI. Um, and usually, the, the firmware for BMCs is proprietary. Uh, sometimes there are open source parts in there. Often there's Linux in there, but everything else um, is usually proprietary. Um, so a year ago, I decided to do something about this, and I got myself um, this board. It was cheap, and it has um, an ILO chip in the middle. There's a lot on there, but um, this interesting part is in the middle. Um, that's a custom chip from HP, which uh, implements all the, the ILO functionality. Um, it's an ARM SOC, so um, you can just use GCC and put code on there. And uh, fortunately for me, the bootloader is not signed. So you can actually just write your own code on the flash. And if the code is kind of correct, it will run and, and do things. Um, the bad thing is HP doesn't provide any documentation for how the ILO hardware actually works. Um, so I can't just uh, go on and port Linux because I don't know how the hardware works. Um, so I started to document how the hardware works with um, a bit of a reverse engineering and poking bits. Um, there's now um, on gitlab.com slash bmc fun um, a repository with some documentation. It's enough to boot Linux. So I have timers and the serial port and, and uh, Ethernet also, which is useful. Um, but none of the really interesting stuff like um, how you control the host, how you do power on, power off, and, and all that. Um, and there's still a lot to do. I need more documentation for all the interesting peripherals in there, which would be needed to make this actually useful. Um, you can port your own operating system um, if you're interested. I'm just releasing documentation for now. So, so it's a bit of a um, white box reverse engineering thing where there's documentation and then a clean new implementation. Um, by the way, I have one of these boards uh, with me. Um, talk to me here if you're interested in getting it. Um, and uh, from ILO 5, um, they started to sign um, the bootloader. But I'd really like to figure out how it works exactly, because um, I'm not sure it protects against everything that could be done um, to run custom code on there. Um, there were a few groups of people who helped along the way. Um, Airbus and Synactive uh, released um, interesting research on vulnerabilities in ILO. Um, the OpenBMC project uh, showed that it is possible to run a BMC with fully free software. Uh, Ghidra, the disassembler and uh, decompiler, helped a lot. And Thank you for listening. Go to this URL if you're interested. Thank you. You did great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, the next talk is held by Mastro Gippo, and he is telling us something I like to do myself very much also. So it's called Backstage Penetration. Oh, thank you. Hello. Uh, okay, hello everybody. Um, uh, so uh, there was this concert in Italy. It's, uh, it was a huge concert, and uh, um, there were probably most of the uh, biggest artists, uh, biggest Italian artists uh, uh, in Italy there. And uh, I was, it was for a 20th anniversary of a radio show, and uh, I really wanted to get uh, into the backstage to meet uh, my heroes. So I started thinking, uh, we went there uh, maybe an hour earlier, so I started thinking about how to get into uh, the backstage. There, were, uh, a lot of, there was a lot of security, um, so I started thinking about how to get a, a badge. So I started taking picture uh, with my brand new phone uh, with a super zoom uh, to try and, uh, and take a good picture of, uh, of a badge. Uh, and maybe uh, print it later, uh, maybe get out of the concert and get to a close uh, uh, print shop or, uh, or maybe uh, next time uh, get one of these printers. Uh, but it's uh, pretty heavy, it's hard to, to bring around. Um, it's, it's not very comfortable to, to have on your backpack uh, during a concert. Uh, but uh, definitely this is uh, a, a very good idea to, to bring one of these uh, to, to an event. And uh, maybe you can also uh, have some preparation before the event. So I didn't know about that, I didn't follow the, the social media of, uh, of this event too much, too closely. Uh, but yeah, why bother uh, making the effort to take a very good quality picture of a badge when uh, there's Instagram. <laughs> so thank you to thanks to this artist, or maybe even thanks to this uh, all areas friend <laughs> uh, that posted this about uh, two hours before the concert started. So you just have to bring a laptop, uh, maybe scan some uh, uh, social medias, and you will get a badge, and then go somewhere and have it printed. But we didn't have the time, we didn't want to uh, go to the effort to, to crop it, uh, to prepare it, to print it. We also had almost half an hour before the concert started. So we started looking around. And well, basically this is the, uh, how it was configured. There was a main stage and there was a big rail holding back all the people. And at the sides of the rail there were uh, uh, security guards uh, looking at the badges to, to decide who to let in and who, to, who cannot let in, uh, can, cannot be let in. Uh, and uh, these security guards are third parties, they are not uh, from the same uh, organization of the concert, so they don't really know uh, which badge is this night or uh, whatever the event is. So they need uh, uh, um, something to, to check them against. And uh, on this rail, uh, there was uh, an A4 paper, uh, piece of paper attached with uh, the picture of uh, all the badges for them to easily compare. <laughs> and of course, you can just uh, uh, take it <laughs> and uh, rip apart one of uh, the badges. I decided to be an artist. Uh, both because uh, I was kind of a con artist and uh, because it didn't... Uh, there were many, many artist badges around, so they couldn't know uh, everybody. And also I used uh, a piece of string from the gadget, from the gadget uh, they gave away <laughs> to, to, to make a necklace. So this was my badge. Uh, I, carefully, I didn't have knives or anything, so I just uh, cut the paper and uh, fold it on the back. And yeah, this is it. <laughs> and I'm in. So I got in. I met uh, my favorite artist, showing proudly my fake badge. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to, to give you uh, some, some takeaway, that, uh, some ideas that I got from this. So uh, the most important thing is to look around, to learn how people behave, to understand what everyone is doing, uh, to see how they are interacting with, uh, uh, with the security. And, uh, um, and mimic what everyone is doing. 
there were three important things. Uh, the water bottle. Everyone in the concert didn't, uh, couldn't have a water bottle uh, with a cap on. So only people from the backstage could have uh, a cap on the bottle uh, because uh, all the bars were removing the, the caps before giving away the bottles. So I had a cap on my pocket and I closed my bottle to make it look like I was backstage. Uh, also the t-shirt. They were selling t-shirt like, uh, like people, like artists. And a smug face, so good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next on stage is Stefan Schindler with make rustfest.eu more environmentally friendly. Hello. There you are. Here is your clicker, your Thank slides you come out. Wonderful. Is this close enough? Okay. This close. Wonderful. So, uh, Welcome to my uh, very spontaneous talk. Actually, it's too bright today. Um, so we have been uh, looking at multiple things at Rustfest. We try to be very inclusive. Um, but one thing we noticed uh, actually pretty late was we were flying a lot of people over a lot of places. So what are we? Now we are looking at the train map. So next iteration will be on Barcelona, which is the, I don't know, flame-shaped thing on the bottom left in, in Spain. And these are all the connections we looked up for our uh, attendees and our speakers uh, that were, are sure to work because there's no Brexit or anything else strange happening. So. Oh, these are flipped. Rustfest is a community conference, like camp as well. And um, since you know climate change is happening and a uh, bad thing, all of these people had to go uh, to Rome. So these are 400 people. And yeah, you could fill a plane if they were from the same city. Or it takes, I think, 50 planes for all of them to get there. So back to the map. So we started with, uh, with these cities to see if we can reach uh, Barcelona in a reasonable amount of time. And it turns out we, we have a winner. The longest route is from Oslo. It takes almost three days and it goes uh, via Gothenburg. So this is the purple line. So let me walk you through it. So worst case, if you're inside Europe, you go from your city, Oslo, to Gothenburg and sleep there for a night. Then you go from Gothenburg to Copenhagen and Hamburg during the next day and then go for, I don't know, go for dinner. Then you take the night train from Hamburg to Frankfurt to Basel to Zurich and arrive in the morning. There you take a shower, go to a pre-event, and then in the afternoon, you take the next train, go to Geneva, and then to Barcelona. And there you go. So it takes you at worst two and a half days to get to Barcelona and back, or, or back, sorry. So um, we are hoping that more people will show up and say, hey, uh, one of the routes passed through my city, like Paris is a good candidate that they will make a pre-event so people will go there and uh, join the ride. Which also means that if you depart together from the same event and go to the same next event, you will ride together so you can have a hack session in the train during the ride. Um, also, the CFP is open until uh, the end of the week or Monday, I don't know, a couple of days more. And if you're interested in the Rust programming language, um, come and join us. It's uh, the beginning of November. Um, if you're interested in more stuff that I do personally, then go to estada.ch um, yeah, or find me around here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next talk is about Open Laser Tech. It's held by Florian. We are really looking forward to it. It's looking promising.
Hi, ich bin Florian und vor ungefähr einem Jahr war ich mal zusammen mit Freunden Lasertag spielen. Für die Leute, die nicht wissen, was Lasertag ist, da hat man so Dinge in der Hand und es geht darum, sich gegenseitig abzuschießen. Das Ganze aber nur mit Licht in Verrot, um genau zu sein. Und danach saß ich zusammen mit den Freunden an der Spree und wir haben uns gedacht, ähm, mit meinen Nerdfreunden und haben überlegt, könnte man sowas auch selber bauen. Ja, äh, ähm, ein Jahr später sieht es so aus. Das ist so unser erster Prototyp, um zu gucken, ob unsere Idee äh, funktioniert. Und äh, ich habe es auch hier mitgebracht. Ähm, unsere Idee, wir wollen ähm, ein Open Source, Open Hardware Laser Tag System bauen. Was man hier sieht, ist äh, zum Beispiel dieser schwarze Punkt, das ist ein Infrarotempfänger. Ähm, man sieht da eine Linse auf dem rechten Bild und ähm, genau das Gehäuse besteht jetzt aus äh, solchen Plastikrohren. Äh, ähm, genau. Ähm, was ist drin? Äh, drin ist ein ESP32 mit Wi-Fi und Bluetooth on board. Ähm, die Powerversorgung machen wir über eine ganz normale Powerbank. Und zum System gehört noch dazu eine Android-App und ein Server. Das kann ich jetzt noch gleich erklären, warum. So haben wir uns das gedacht. Die Tagger, nennt man es im Lasertag, die kommunizieren über Infrarot miteinander. Und die Tagger wiederum über Bluetooth mit der Smartphone-App. Ja, warum eigentlich eine Smartphone-App? Da war unsere Idee einfach, dass, also man könnte ja auch das Spiel äh, komplett irgendwie auf den Mikrocontrollern programmieren, aber da dachten wir uns, mit dem Smartphone ist man einfach noch wesentlich flexibler, was irgendwie Updates angeht ähm, und ähm, man kann noch viele weitere Features nutzen, wie jetzt zum Beispiel GPS oder so, könnte man irgendwie seine Spielzonen abstecken, um jetzt draußen irgendwo ähm, Lasertag zu spielen. Genau, äh, kommunizieren, äh, tun dann die Apps miteinander über einen Server. Ja, ähm, was gibt es bisher? Also äh, wir haben hier, wie gesagt, diesen äh, Tagger-Prototyp schon fertig. Äh, der kann auch schon in Farot schießen und irgendwie getroffen werden. Die Verbindung mit der App steht auch schon. Äh, und ähm, die, äh, das ist eben eine, bisher eine simple App, die irgendwie dann registriert, dass man getroffen wurde. Genau. Ähm, der Server ist bisher noch so ein bisschen, ähm, da ist noch nicht so viel, sage ich mal. Ähm, ja, was kann ich noch erzählen? Genau, unser Ziel war es noch, irgendwie diese Tagger möglichst günstig zu machen dass man irgendwie davon auch mal 20 äh, oder 10 bauen kann und dann mit seinen fünf Freunden äh, einfach im Park draußen spielen kann. Ja, falls ihr Lust habt, ähm, irgendwie mitzumachen oder das einfach verfolgen wollt, ähm, hier habt ihr ein paar Links zu GitHub oder Twitter zu mir. Ähm, sprecht mich an. So, ja, yeah. if you didn't understand anything because you're not speaking German, we are building an open source laser tag system. Speak to me if you're interested in it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time has really flown by. We have arrived at our last talk of this camp's lightning talk session. I would like to introduce to the stage uh, Etienne Wang with Janitor. So, where is there a tweet sweeper on the screen? Hi. So I wanted to talk about Janitor, which is a side project I've been working on with friends for some years now. And a great backstory for this project would be from working on Firefox to bootstrapping development environments. So that's the title of the, st uh, of the talk. So we are a small team working on this side project. Uh, the main developer of this project is Jan Keromnes. Uh, he worked at Mozilla when he first created the project. He was uh, working on developer tools for Firefox, and then he moved to Typefox to work on Gitpod, an IDE for GitHub. And I joined, uh, I joined on the ride for this project. 
I am a sysadmin for the janitor, and right now I work for Defora Networks, which is an IT security company based in Berlin, and I also worked for a cyber security club in France, whose name is Academint. And also there are a lot, of, there are some more people who joined us on the ride and who brought some features, some cool features and some, yeah, some exciting features. So what is Janitor? Why Janitor? We, we realized while working on Firefox, you can't directly work on Firefox and put some and have some contributions landed directly in Firefox. You need first to download gigabytes of stuff, like cloning the repository and downloading with your package manager some dependencies, configure these dependencies if it's not automatic, automatically done, uh, configure the tool chain and read some documentation to know about the workflow and so on. And you have to do this again and again if you switch from one device to another. Um, if you switch from one operating system to another, you will need to maybe learn how it works on your new operating system. And if you are just curious about, uh, about uh, learning about some projects, you will need to read documentation for some projects just for basic, uh, for basic commands. So with, uh, with Janitor, we wanted to get rid of all of that and to let newcomers and developers focus on coding and landing features. So if you want to have a look right now, it's available at janitor.technology. And because I wanted to play it safe, I'm not doing a live demo. I, will, I have it on slides now. So Janitor, you can create containers to work on projects. Right now, we have 15 supported projects from Firefox to Chromium, Thunderbird, and so on. You work on, in private containers, you've, um, which come fully pre-configured, a full checkout of the source code, and these containers are ready in two seconds or less. You get access to a web IDE and to, terminal, and to a terminal. This terminal gets uh, all the latest tools, like Git with the latest version, GCC, and so on. Uh, you get the full checkout, of course, of the source code. You've got some smart helpers to get you running faster than on your local machine, I guess. And you get also sudo access, so if you want to install software in the container, you can. You also get access to web preview if you want to try out some web projects, and you get access also to a remote desktop environments if you want to run a just compiled version of Firefox, for example. Uh, basically, how it works behind the scenes, we are we need a Docker file, which uh, we are working from a Docker file, a base Docker file, which will be Ubuntu Dev, and then from this Docker file, you will check out the source code, you install your dependencies, and then that's done. It's, uh, it's ready to be put on janitor.technology. So for this project, what's next? First, we want, to update, so we want to update the projects to be much more fresher, and we want to, uh, uh, and we want to learn some new features. We want also to have some more workflow integration, so you spend less time reading documentation for basic commands, and you spend more time reading documentation for complex stuff, which is great. Uh, we want also to add new Docker hosts to the cluster, so we can welcome you know, more people and more projects. Uh, we, I want to add live collaboration feature, which would let you uh, work uh, with people in the same container, have the same preview, same web preview, or same um, remote desktop. And if you want to have your project added on Janitor, it's possible. Uh, it's possible. You just need a Docker file for that. For that. So if you're interested, you can reach us on Freenode, you can reach us on Twitter, and you can check out on Janitor, Technology, and on GitHub. Thanks. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. So these were the lightning talks for this camp. There will be other lightning talks probably on the next Chaos Communication Congress. And to wrap up all the talks, I have to say some thank yous to a lot of people who make all this awesomeness here possible. The first thank you goes out to Get goes out to Getzik, who normally does the lightning calls, couldn't be here, but supported us with a lot of infrastructure. Please give big hands to Getzik for supporting us. Applause 
And of course, all this here would not be possible without so many angels supporting us, the translation angels, the stage managers, the heralds, the video angels, and many, many others. And last but not least, a big thank you to Honky, who helped me here on stage. Thank you so much, all of you.